Good evening. I would like to start this um, meeting of the Gloucester City Council on November 12th, 2024. This meeting of the City Council is recorded on Zoom with a link that is posted on the agenda. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer device, there is a raised hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to be recognized to speak. If technical difficulties arise and the Zoom link is interrupted during an in-person hybrid meeting, the City Council and the City Council has a quorum. The meeting may continue after efforts have been made to reestablish the link. The minutes shall note the interruptions. It is the finding of the, Gloucester, of the City of Gloucester that no individual should be denied equal treatment or opportunity because of their age, ancestry, color, disability, including intellectual and developmental mental disability, family status, immigration status, gender identity or expression, military status, marital status, national origin, race, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. Tonight we have um, the city councilors, are, uh, Dylan Benson, Ward 2 Councilor. Um, we have Valerie Gilman, Councilor at Large. We have Frank Majorta, Ward 3 Councilor. Four. Ward 4 Councilor, that's right. We have Jeff Worthley, Councilor at Large. Marjorie Grace, who is the actual Ward 3 Councilor. Sean, I mean, uh, Skip on you, Jason. Jason Grow, who's uh, Councilor at Large, and Sean Nolan, who is the Council Vice President and Ward 5 Councilor. Um, yeah, I just I want to say we have, um, do you know who's online? Who, who we have? Okay, thanks. So we have um, in attendance, we have our city clerk, Grace Poirier. Then we have remote, we have Nancy Pappas, Tim Good. Um, they're the, with the assessor's department. Oh, and Gary Johnstone. Uh, Connor McCorkle, uh, the CFO, Jill Cahill, the CAO. And we have Dana Martin, the engineer, in person. Sorry about that. I'm busy gabbing and not getting ready here. Okay. So we will have the um, flag salute and a couple of moments of silence. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for, which for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. I'd like to pull a moment of silence for Bill Rochford. Um, Bill Rochford was a great man in the city of Gloucester who was an advocate for anybody that needed anything whether it was home needs, transportation, or anything to help a family in need get by. He worked very well with the Action Shelter, um, with CADA to start that, and worked on anything that mattered. As a person growing up in Magnolia, he could always go by Bill's house, visit his family, wonderful family, hard work, and he, he took pride in his home, taking care of it and working hard. And it was always an open door for anybody in need. And I'd like to take a few moments to give a moment of silence for Bill. Um, I would like to speak on um, Joe Ferrante, unless someone else would like to take on that tonight. So Joe Ferrante was um, obviously the, the dad of our state rep, Ann Margaret Ferrante. Um, he was a fisherman, he loved our city, he was always willing to talk about his experiences 
in the fishing industry, and he loved his daughter. And um, he passed away, and um, he'll always be remembered as a wonderful man with a great spirit who, again, did so much for the city. So moment of silence in addition for Joe Ferrante. All right, and now we will have oral communications. The public shall have the opportunity at every regularly scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communications shall allow any resident and or property owner and or business owner who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to city, to city business to appear before the council, make their statement without debate, and the council will refer matters to the office of the mayor. Person speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes. Hello, oh, it's on, okay, great, thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Goodick. Um, a lot of you know me. I live at 10 Dog Town Road. I'm a lifelong Gloucester resident, and my husband and I have built our home up on Dog Town Road, and we've been living there about 30 years. Um, my property abuts Dog Town Common, if you don't realize that. I'm one of two abutters. There's two homes on that road as you go up to Dog Town. Unfortunately, there seems to be some um, usage of the conservation land up there for detonating bombs. And so I wanna bring that to your attention, whether or not you're aware of it. Um, several occasions since I've lived there, there have been the city police, the fire department and a bomb squad driving up there and detonating bombs. It, we're sitting on one big ledge up there of granite. So if you think it's not impacting my house, I beg to differ with you that it is. Recently, I was on a flight coming home. My adult children were at home and texted me feverishly while I was on a flight, ruining my very nice vacation, I might add. So the house was shaken, there was explosions going around, and my daughter's hysterical. So in addition to that, on Facebook, there's a Gloucester sites thing, and it's all over there too. So it's not just my house and my neighbors. It's very loud, the pictures in my house are shaking. So it's not like it's some little explosion, it's really serious. And if you're not living there so you don't feel it, but again, during my flight, I'm contacting whoever I have as city councilors. So I had two of them on my cell phone. I contacted both of them. I also saw that the chief of police is saying that it was fireworks. Trust me, I know the difference between fireworks and an explosion. The fireworks could be set off in my front yard and they would not shake my house. I can tell you there are cracks going around my foundation in my driveway. It is one big granite slab. So to not get a response back is one thing. To be told that it's fireworks is also another thing. It's the, the um, failure to, to really be transparent on what's happening. I mean, I call the chief of police and I'm told it's fireworks. It's ridiculous. So October 13th, the hill's exploding. There's people down on Raynard Street talking about it. And as an abutter of the land, I am requesting and pretty much demanding that the city council or the mayor give me some clear explanation of what was blowing up up there on the 13th of October. It's not the first time, and, and I hope that it's the last time. I come each time to speak, and I don't feel like anybody at the city really understands the impact that has on my family and my property. Um, so it seems like the information is hidden 
And um, I think that the city should find another place to be detonating bombs versus driving them up in my back driveway. Thank you. Thank you. And you did it. <laughs> you would have had me. <laughs> You know the drill. And it changes a lot. Good evening, Marianne Boucher, 93 Mount Pleasant Avenue. I filed two public records requests with the city, one for the language of the Acts of Land Transfer in Gloucester, chapters 152 and 284, Maidos Field to the East Gloucester site that were signed into law, and also a request for the deed signed by Mayor Verger on April 1st of this year. I did not receive the correct information within the 10 business days, so I contacted Senator Bruce Tarr's office and received the necessary paperwork within one hour. On February 13th of this year, a vote of the City Council passed, Certificate of Vote number 2024-018 and dated February 20th, 2024, to accept lands to be used for municipal park and open space purposes as set forth in chapter 152 of the acts of 2020 and chapter 284 of the acts of 2020 and was subject to the protections afforded under article 97 of the amendments of Massachusetts constitution of the Commonwealth in perpetuity. A deed was witnessed and signed by Mayor Verga on April 1st of this year, 2024. Chapter 152 with six sections was approved with the legislative body and on, on August 7th, 2020, amendments to chapter 152 were made. And on January 7th, 2021, chapter 152 and 284 was signed into law and known as the Acts of Land Transfer in Gloucester. I'd like to note some wording in section five and it reads as follows. If construction of demolition upon the removal of any structures from the land referred to in section one, that's Webster Street, does not commence or Meadows Field, within four years from the land transfers referenced above, then the care, custody, and control of the land in section one shall revert to the Department of Public Works of the City of Gloucester to be placed under the protection of Article 97 of the amendments of the Constitution of the Commonwealth. And the care, custody, and control of the land in section two, EGS, shall revert, revert to the school committee of the city. EGS closed its doors in June of 2022 the building was going to be demolished last winter. Winter turned into the spring. Spring turned into this fall, and just a few weeks ago, the open, during the Open Space Commission meeting, there was a mention of no date. I stood here on October 8th in favor of the mayor's request to approve an additional $2 million to increase the $4.2 loan order to 6.2 for the vote purpose of the demolition and leveling of the EGS building. As, as the 1.2 million allocated was used elsewhere, only leaving 73,000 available. The GD Times mentioned that the cost for demo had increased to 1.9 site. The concern, when does the four year time frame run out? When is the reasoning behind, the, what is the reasoning behind the stall? EGS closed two years and five months ago. Will the no net loss article 97 swap not take place? I hate to say it, but it does feel intentional. Yeah. Will this be the one more, one more sentence? Will this be passive open space that the city council you spoke of on October 8th? And will the city move forward with the demolition of the building? Will the city put the protection on the land? And will the portion of the Lieutenant Arthur Maxwell Parsons playground be returned as Mayor Verga stated on October 6, 2022, letter to me for the children. When transparency exists, so does trust. Thank you. Thank you. Name and record for the uh, name, name and address for the record. Sorry. Handheld, handheld. No, nope, you shut it off. <laughs> Joshua Fishburn, 17 Beacon Street, Ward 3. Um, I appreciate and value your civic leadership and your time. I want you to remember that there's a 
amazing teacher strike going on in our city. It's not on the agenda tonight, should be. The relevance of teachers' concerns and paraprofessionals are meaningful to our entire city. I would like you to remember the tenor and general sentiments of support for the concerns and living wages of our essential workers in the schools, paraprofessionals, teachers, people who every single day are in charge of the living welfare of our children. Whatever the opportunity, whatever the public forum, please acknowledge and express positive affirmation for the educators and paraprofessionals in our schools. This includes supporting them in their efforts to attain contracts and a living wage. As a parent of three children in the Gloucester Public School System for 16 years, I ask the council and the mayor to support the demands of paraprofessionals for an increase in wages. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Adrian Rickyman. I live at 42 Summer Street. I'm a firm believer in democracy, and I thank you for this opportunity. I come to you tonight as a proud citizen of Gloucester, a proud mother of two children in the Gloucester public school system, and as a proud teacher at West Parish School. The last time I was up here addressing the city council, I was fighting for my job as a first year teacher when my position was to be cut mid-year. That was in 2003. Now I am up here 21 years later. I was hoping to never have to stand up here again, yet here I am. Teachers are creative by nature. We are met with complex issues every day. We ask to do so much with so very little. This has been a trend and it has only intensified in the last few years. We cannot operate this way and should not be asked to do so. Please, I implore you tonight to do everything you can to fix this crisis within our city. Make our schools a priority. I stand with our teachers, our power professionals who make poverty wages, our city, and most importantly, our students. I have faith that you will stand with us as well. Thank you. Michelle Genovese, 22 Blumenau. Um, I am one of those paraprofessionals that makes party, poverty wages. I have to work a second job in order to keep a roof over my head. There are many, many women in my union that do the same thing. They work the after school program. They work tirelessly so that they can make ends meet. I don't feel as though any of my union siblings should have to choose between a meal and a roof over their head. We are out there making sure that the community that we live in has people to continue to run it. And yet the people that are running it are not helping us. I ask of you, the school committee, to speak with the school committee, reach out to them if you can and help us stop this. These kids need to be back in their classrooms with us. We want to be back in the classrooms with them. Every day that we're with them, we worry about them, and we worry about them even more. Help us get back in the classrooms. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Okay, we're going to go to the people online. Um, we have Kathy Ryan. You're there. Hi, counselors. Um, Kathy, 17 High Rock. I wrote the mayor, the CAO, uh, DPW, and community development directors, and I want to loop you in too, to alert them to more city-owned art damage 
in the Committee for the Arts monthly, October 29th, two members mentioned damage done by the new restoration to the sta Stage Fort Park Tablet Rock Founders Plaque Conservation went awry, that the company engaged to do the work, quote, didn't do green. Um, of course it didn't do green. You may remember I warned this would happen, was unnecessary and re recommended not to proceed. I first tried to speak about it at subcommittee before it came to the full study council, but was point of ordered and blocked from speaking that it wasn't relevant. I emailed and received no response. I spoke up again when it came to full council and the CPC hearing, but the newly re reconstituted committee for the arts went full steam ahead with funding, including ARPA funds. Bronze restoration by definition removes surface. This founder's plaque was not on our list of the city's art most in need of restoration but it was the target of a conflict of interest fundraising campaign. It's not reversible, you know, it's done. Um, city art that didn't need any restoration was also damaged because of major undisclosed conflicts of interest. Murals outside Kairos Auditorium with an astringent that removed layers and layers of glazing. Murals at O'Malley. The bronze war memorial plaques in the rotunda were damaged and had to be redone also, a small one on Stacy Boulevard. A Ken Gore painting was damaged by a label, rubber cemented to the wall, and you know when it migrated. A small plaque on Stacy Boulevard, I already said that. Regarding the city, the city's historic mural holdings, an exhaustive and comprehensive conservation report was completed by Williamstown Art Conservation Center. Writing an RFP for a new one is a misuse of funds because theirs would be the penultimate assessment and it was already completed and paid for. A scan of the full report was on the city's site on the Committee for the Arts page as WAC and was removed rather recently. I urge IT and the city to make it available again. The murals awaiting care wrapped by Williamstown cannot be unwrapped for a new RFP due to more damage and health and safety concerns, lead exposure and more. And remember City Hall was just newly cleaned after fire smoke damage. Um, I said that the murals were rescued and they were sent to WAC with prior 26,000 community preservation funds because murals had been damaged by prior restoration made worse by undisclosed conflicts of interest and lack of transparency. After storing, the murals, after storing the murals for multiple years without charge, WAC offered to store the murals there indefinitely for free, optimal safe and climate controlled immaculate facilities as long as work commenced on one murals. I, I do have more to go. How much time do I have, Tony? Uh, that's about it. Just wound down to zero. Um, well, yeah, I'm gonna I'll give do- you 15 seconds. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna just wrap up. It's actually just two, two points. Um, I have repeated that resurrecting the artifacts committee for care for the collection wasn't my idea. It was a former elected officials idea, but I concur would be optimal. And I, re I recommended further split off the living arts to continue with the Committee for the Arts under the purview that's, of community that's it. development. I'm sorry, Catherine. Okay, so I will do part two at the next one. And I'm happy to also make a report. Um, thank you. If you want to submit something, send it to the city clerk. Ahead well, of, I think this is this is the this is the presentation on, on the city holdings and the inventory, and we've paid for six of them since the year 2000, and I was on the committee for years and yeah. know them, and you know, right. the information no, isn't being shared. It was just an offer for you to send any remarks to be on the record. But, yeah, thank, I will, but I'm also going to finish up part two. Thank you, oh, Tony. Yep. Thank okay, you. yeah, part two next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Am Steele. Bring her in. Hi, can you yeah. hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, Pam Steele, 10 Pilots Hill. As you know, I've been going to public meetings and whatever since 2018. I've learned a lot and I'm underwhelmed. I would like a letter from the mayor with a timeline of when they're going to tell the public what's going on with the East Gloucester School property. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Seeing no more hands, um, we will, what's the next order of business, Madam Clerk? Um, presentations, commendations, a presentation by Dana Martin, city engineer, and Eric Kelly, principal engineer of Apex Companies, regarding an update on lead service line inventory. I don't, I don't know how can she share her slides. Oh, so she can share via Zoom. Oh, like, wait a few minutes. Could you share, share? Oh, I have to join the join meeting. Yeah. Yeah. as a panelist. City Council to get a vote to vote. I, I can talk while I get this um, launched. I just have a visual I'd like to share. Um, and of course, I need to update my Zoom. Uh, I'm Dana Martin, city engineer uh, for City of Gloucester, joined today by Eric Kelly, our consultant from Apex Engineering. Um, we're here to talk about a recent inventory we did for our water service lines um, as part of our drinking water distribution system. Um, this is all part of the lead and copper rule, which is an EPA regulation the city is um, complying with. It um, required all public water suppliers in the country to develop um, a comprehensive inventory of water service materials what I'm really hoping to share is a diagram showing what a water service is because I think it's helpful to have a visual. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll give it another a minute, minute or two. Um, um, as part of our inventory, which was submitted um, to the regulators last month, a uh, notification will be going out to water customers who've been identified as having either a, a lead water service, a galvanized water service, or um, unknown material of their water service. So in advance of these letters going out, we were just hoping to brief folks on, on the communication that they'll be receiving and helping them kind of understand that information a little bit better. Um, great, it looks like I'm here. Um, Eric, do you want to? Um, yeah, just so, just to clarify, Dana's going to bring up a graphic just to explain what a service line is and where ownership responsibilities kind of begin and end for both the municipality and the property owner. Um, uh, a key thing to take away is that the city is compliant with the Safe Drinking Water Act as it pertains to lead and copper rule. Um, there are specific treatment practices that uh, the water system uses to prevent corrosion of metals such as lead and copper out of both uh, pub, uh, plumbing in the distribution system as well as interior plumbing within buildings. Um, so no treatment changes have changed all this. This was just a records request essentially through the lead and copper rule because of issues around the country related to lead exposure um, in a uh, older water systems. Um, so the city has become compliant with the inventory, which was submitted in October, uh, on October 16th to MassDEP. Now we are complying with the initial notification requirement that came out of that process. So this is the start of a over 10 year program that will be addressing lead and uh, potentially other service lines that need replacement.
I'll keep. Uh, so in just terms of number, overall numbers, um, the city has a total of 13,437 service lines. Um, so we looked at the, all the existing records we could get available to us made through the city. From that number, we had a total of 12 that identified as at least partially lead, 636 that have galvanized metal, which is the, the reason why EPA is looking at that is that historically those tended to be connected to lead once upon a time. So they're kind of a suspect material, if you will. Um, and then we had 4,639 uh, services where we do not have a record of a material um, which I will say we're doing this work for about two dozen communities in Massachusetts. Um, the ratio of unknowns being that around 40%, give or take, is not uncommon because a lot of times that is a record of what is on the customer's side. There's a lot of good records on the public side, which is what the city would own, but oftentimes that record was not recorded. You know, some of these service lines go back to the early 1900s. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dana just so she can explain the graphic and some of the other stuff. I think this works. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. So I'm hoping this helps folks a little bit understand what we're talking about. So um, the water that we all enjoy um, comes from our surface water reservoirs. Um, it's important to note that lead does not come from your source water. It also isn't in the water as it leaves the plant. Really, your exposure to lead, if it's coming from drinking water, is from piping or plumbing within your home. So your drinking water travels through the city underground in water mains and from water mains, which are for the majority in your street, um, it reaches your house from what's called a water service. Um, a water service refers to the whole pipeline from your water main in the street. It crosses your property line. There's a, a fitting right at the property line that's called a, a water shutoff or, or curb stop, and then continues underground where it enters your home. You all, that's where your water meter is in your basement. Um, the city of Gloucester owns and maintains the water service from the water main to the property line, that shutoff valve, and the rest of it is um, customer owned or owned by the, the property owner. Um, historically, records for water services had a lot of notes on material and information for the side that the water system owns, so what the city owns, and maybe not so great notes about the customer side. Um, so as part of the inventory, if we had records on the material for what the city owns, but no note on the material on the customer side, well, now we consider your service unknown. And so those customers will be receiving letters notifying them that they have a, a water service of unknown material. And um, we're now moving into a period of verification where we're really trying to, um, here, here's the numbers I think Eric reviewed this. I'm sorry, I wasn't really listening. Um, here's the results of our inventory here. I mean, there's some really good news here. Um, less than 1% of water services were identified as lead, less than 5% as galvanized. I believe Eric covered um, the risk of galvanized. It, galvanized itself isn't dangerous, but it does have the ability to absorb lead if there was a lead source upstream of a galvanized service. So um, those services are targeted to be replaced as well. Um, and of the 13, over 13,000 services that we inventoried, a little over 8,000 were identified as non lead. So, so now our goal is to really tackle this unknown category, you know, that's 34% of our water services. And even though we may have data on the city-owned side, we don't have that customer data. And so um, we need to sort out that number before we get into the period of um, replacement. Yeah, and one other thing to add is um, it was prescriptive to, as to what records we could use for this inventory. This was not going into homes and businesses to 
physically verify. It was based on the publicly available records you had. So like the service cards, any water main, main plans that might have had notes, any water division rules and regulations. Some, uh, some communities had things on record that said we stopped using lead as of 1956, for example, so they could kind of rule out anything that was installed after that. That's not normal. It was kind of more unique cases. So this really was a you know, high level view, what do the records say, pointed out what a lot of people expected, there would be a lot of unknowns. So we are gonna to transition to the verification. On the verification side, um, the city's focus is gonna be in a couple different approaches. Um, either the water division has frequent need to be in properties for water meter, change outs, service calls, things like that. Those will be uh, utilized to build out the inventory further. Similarly, inspectional services and housing staff are often in properties as well. They are gonna be given the same inventory as well, just so that we can supplement and slowly chip away at those. In addition, the state of Massachusetts has made a customer service line identification app available so that people can self-report. Um, it's relatively simple. You basically have to give them your address, what, water, what city, municipality you live in, and it's already been pre-populated on the back end that those, those, and that information uh, will come back to the city uh, water compliance office, and then that will be a new record that has to be checked. And so, so that's to help whittle away at the number of unknowns because most communities their their biggest issue is really resolving the unknowns. Um, similar, once that starts getting stood up, then it will become more a process. If folks have questions, they can call the water compliance office or email the water compliance office and schedule appointments, somebody can come out and check it. Um, so that over the next three years, in accordance with the lead and copper rule, we have to complete the verification process, then it transitions to replacement. A lot of information on this slide, but this is just an overall general timeline because I'm sure folks are thinking, okay, well now you have this information, what's, what's next? And um, we're, currently in compliance with all regulations through EPA and Mass DEP. Um, we follow all regulations related to lead and copper. We're, co we're currently in compliance. Um, we've done rounds and rounds of distribution sampling. Um, with no hits for lead, we're actually on a reduced sampling schedule. Um, and again, we've had no violations. Um, so we're still confident in our water but we are moving into this phase of kind of verifying all the information in our inventory. And then um, by 2027, public water suppliers have to submit a plan for replacement. So um, we're, we're, we're getting the information out to our water customers as soon as possible, um, but we're not yet in the stage where we have a approved replacement plan with the state or with the EPA. Did you touch on corrosion control? Um, whose role? Uh, whose role? Cor corrosion control in our system. It, it's, I, I, I feel that's like comforting to know that um, there is cor corrosion control as part of our treatment process. It's effectively like a coating on the pipes in in our distribution system that's meant to prevent lead from leaching out, and so. Um, that's a protection for all our customers. And that would go in the service line? Yeah. Correct. Um, also, as part of what's been happening to date, um, the city as the public water system operator has to submit a lead and copper sampling plan that's reviewed and approved by MassDP. So those are specific sites around the city that traditionally have been identified as being potentially higher risk than others. So you've already going to more potentially high risk lead and copper sample sites. That plan gets updated now based on the inventory. So that will be subject to mass DP approval in the coming months. And that will be doubling the number of sample sites for initially so that everyone's recalibrating based on the inventory. And then you do your monitoring, you report back annually in the water quality report, um, which has to be published and, and publicly provided to all the customers. So that will be part of more of the public education and outreach as more sampling happens and then keep reporting back annually as we go through the uh, the regulation. On the sampling, I know um, back in the 
uh, early 90s. Um, I had a home that was a, built in 1867, and the city um, environmental engineer asked me if I would, um, you know, sample mine. I think it was just a, I don't think it was mandatory at that time, obviously. And so I did. There was none. Um, but uh, how are we going to get the samples in the houses? So similar to what's done, you have to suggest certain sites. You have to get agreement from the property owner to become a sample site, and then that customer becomes the sampler, which is exactly how it exists today. There is changes in how EPA is requesting those samples to be collected, so there's additional instructions. Essentially, you capture more total water bottles get collected, and then you take very specific ones, and those are the ones that get analyzed. So kind of like first flush and running water after several bottles have been collected. So there will be a whole other outreach program for those that are going to be the likely sites because you have not only the ones you've been doing to date, but plus the added new ones that are coming out of the inventory. Now, the, the 3,640, uh, 4,639 um, unknowns, are we going to, do they, do the sample to prove they don't have lead? Or if they don't do that, then we... So through some combination of either city staff or self-identification, those will go hopefully from unknown to fitting into one of the other three categories, either non-lead, lead, or galvanized. So that's the initial push for the next three years is to get reduce the number of unknowns. Um, and as you track that moving forward, you can have people, you can come up with alternative programs to try and accelerate that process. But a, the initial push is going to be through city staff, through routine scheduled visits, uh, called in appointments, or self identification by the customers. Can we put the timeline up again? Yeah. Sorry, I was in the wastewater field and water. Um, So oh, we have to, this has to be completed by 2037, but um, we have to identify the entire inventory by 2027. Yeah, they give you three years to up, uh, update the inventory is an annual requirement, but the one that is issued in October of 2027 becomes the benchmark you use for your replacement plan which covers all the way to 2037. And is this requirement, um, it's federal? It's started with federal and it's being implemented and overseen by MassDEP. Now, what if at the federal government they repeal this, this amendment to the Clean Water Act? Well, roll with that if that is the Mass way. MassDEP still force us to do it? Uh, they could choose to adopt their own regulation if they show choose. Um, just as a, an example, the state of New Jersey implemented something on their own um, that preceded federal action on this in 2021. So there's similar to some other drinking water regulations, there's there's nothing that MassTP can't make something more conservative or continue a program because they are the uh, delegated authority here in the state. Right. Um, Unknown. Uh, Dana, great job tonight. Uh, Eric, this question for you. Um, I, I actually spoke to a few people in the water department that do the water meters. <clears throat> There's a real easy way for homeowners to understand what they have if they can get access to their water meter. And it's to looking at the type of feed that comes through the foundation and whether it, it's a gray pipe or a green or a copper pipe is one way to start. Um, I think that, that would be a process to help identify if there's a possible change in Dana, if that's something we can get out to the public in the email to ask or maybe ask them to ask their plumbers. That may give us a head start on what they have for the, the service coming to the home. I understand a pipe could break in the middle of the yard. They put copper in because that's new, modern, and do it. There's still maybe some sort of lead there. Um, my brother lives in Peabody. And they're going through the same thing right now. And what they're, the challenge would do is to go out and get the test kits. And they're, they're not that expensive. And to do a test and see what it comes up as. 
So if we can get you guys to get out there with, with an email to the regular city to notify people, some of these things may be helpful um, for just common knowledge. You know, what, what comes into your foundation? Does it look like an old pipe that you saw on a playground when you were growing up? Does it look copperish or, or, or green? Or is it galvanized like a fence? Um, and that could be starting points to help us. If that could help you guys, that's great. If not, thank you for doing your work. So just to, the state's uh, customer identification tool has those little metrics on color, you know, if you can scratch it, if it's magnetic, things like that. And then essentially the customer just puts in their address, the name of their municipality, what they believe it to be in a photo, and it gets uploaded and automatically sent to the city. So it has those features you're talking about. And in the letter that goes to the, prop, the 4639 properties that are unknown, there is a QR code and a link to get to that tool that brings you to the DEP website that explains that whole process. Um, Thank you, Eric. So that's something that's going to be sent out to the Alaska? Yes. Um, these letters were expected to be in the mail today. They had to be mailed by Friday this week. So all, all those with the 12 lead, the 636 galvanized, and the 4639 unknowns, all those letters are out the door this week. Excellent. Thank so, you very much. Yeah. Great Any non-lead or non-lead customers will not receive a letter. However, these three other categories will all be receiving letters. And just also key to note that that these letters will go out annually until you fall into either a non-lead category or your service line has been replaced. So there's an annual notification. So if a property were to turn over or you have tenants or something like that, that notification keeps coming out annually just so that it's people are updated. And Philip Rowe. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so let's cut to the chase. You get a letter, find out you've got lead in pipes. What's the deal after that? I mean, you, you obviously, the, the goal is to get them replaced. Are they mandated to get them replaced? They, they bear the full cost of that replacement? And does that include pipes that come into the house, also maybe run throughout the house? So we're talking about potentially major, major projects here. And what are, what are the consequences of not doing it? So one of, um, I'll break this down in parts. Uh, this is only related to the service line, not interior plumbing. So as soon as you get to the meter, whatever is going on in your specific property, that is of the um, property owner's responsibility if they were to go do it. Um, uh, lead was eff effectively banned in 1986 and a lot of the things that are in our interior plumbing, so lead solder, um, so a lot of anything new plumbing that's been done post-1986 was kind of considered to be exempt from this requirement. You could be deemed non-lead. Um, as far as the costs and responsibility, one of the uh, uniqueness of this regulation is they're requiring replacement of lead service lines, but the public water system doesn't own the service line in its entirety. So it gets into a gray area where you have the potential for work to be done on private properties, but who funds that? There's nothing that would preempt a property owner from going and hiring a contractor to get their lead or galvanized service line replaced on their own accord. Um, that gets done periodically, I think, because po folks have issues with their own service lines if they have leaks and things like that. Um, right now, what after verification, the city will be responsible for submitting a plan to the state that will say, how are we going to deal with that, which is going to have to touch on how do you fund it? How do you deal with the property ownership issue? Some communities are waiting to see how others do it. Are they going to be passing additional rules and regulations to say, we're going to pay for work on private property, maybe just for the service line material? Is there something that it's going to be contracts go out and there's reimbursement or credits that that the nature of the system of how the, how it's paid for per replacement is not yet known just because there's some uniqueness on the property ownership. As far as funding goes, the state through the additional infrastructure funds that have come back to the Drinking Water Trust, they have prioritized lead replacement. So there is special uh, funding opportunities made available for the next uh, remaining four years dedicated explicitly to lead service line replacement. Has there been any discussion on making this a betterment issue so that the city can come in and do multiple projects, maybe on a street or, or in an area? And then better that to the to the homeowner, I would assume, by helping to reduce costs in that general 
way. I haven't discussed that. Um, one more thought is that the letters that are going out and the web page we have under the water compliance page on the city website do have some resources, some educational resources about, you know, health effects of lead, um, mm. EPA recommendations for filters and sample kits um, if you have concerns. But at this at this point, you know, we're all about the verification right. of the data. And um, if someone has concerns about the health effects of lead, there's some resources yeah. for them. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dana and Eric, for your presentation. It was very helpful. Uh, I've got a number of questions. Do we know the area of the city where we don't have the information, the unknowns? Is it concentrated in a certain area or is it spread equally through the city? Um, we're in the process of getting all this updated to the city's GIS program so we can see and look for any geographic. Um, generally speaking, we did a lot of cross-referencing with assessor's records, which has information about original construction, any major rehab. So we also tried to, anything that had been you know, no longer existed or it showed that it was new construction post-1986, that goes into the non-lead category. So we did do that, but... Which, was it which category? Non-lead, if you're okay. post-1986. You. Um, so we haven't done it in great detail. We do have the inventory. It's available through Dana's office where you can go and look at your address um, and call up or email, and we can tell you what you are if, if the letter hasn't arrived yet or it's delayed due to mail service, what have you. Um, that information is available at the address scale. We are going to be moving it over to GIS, at least for internal, and then we have to. There will be a way to see it, so you can say, "Oh, I looked at my property," and like that. That's something that we have to just now bring it to the GIS environment. The reason why I ask is I think it would be helpful, especially if a ward councilor knew there's a concentration in their ward, that maybe we could also be helpful as city councilors to help focus on if there's a certain area. And it sounds like older homes would be more likely to be subject to this. So, um, but either way, I just want to get that out there um, as an idea. Second question is, you said you've identified 12 that are already with, with lead in them. Do those 12 know that they have lead in them? They get their own specific letter. Okay. So there's three, uh, MassTP developed three templates that we were only allowed to provide contact information adjustments to. The, the language that is there is prescribed by the state. There's a letter that goes to the lead service line properties. There's one that goes to the galvanized properties and then one that goes to the unknown. The language is generally very similar, except they're, they're structured to be that type because there might, unknown is really more of a, we don't know what you have, you might have something. Here's how to go help us verify. The other two are more like, these are the reasons why you're getting your specific letter galvanized because historically those were downstream of potentially lead services, lead because of just, some portion of your service based on the records and information may be led. Those would be ones that also could be follow up just for verifying because it could just be an old record and if you go in the basement and it's a copper service. Um, it's just like Dana explained, the customer side of the record wasn't always something that got updated because the city's responsibility stopped at the curb. Um, I would like to think that everybody would want to know what their water service has in it. I, maybe there might be a landlord that doesn't want to know and doesn't want their tenants to know it's possible, but I would think everyone would want to know. Um, is there something we can do? I appreciate the letter going out. Um, we have visits to homes from different agencies. I know we have a whole team of assessors who are here. I'm not asking them to do more than they already do, but maybe there's a note that can be left with people. Uh, I know that in with action and with, uh, with um, talk, there's all sorts of needs in the police department, there's different needs for people to go into homes. Um, is there a way to sort of cross pollinate where people are uh, going into homes already to leave a note that says this is important and here's how you get it tested, for example. Are we doing that now and can we do that? Uh, right now we had a meeting uh, just last week with inspectional services and housing. So they, in addition to the water division, are often in homes for different reasons. They are gonna be given the same information so they can update just because it's another touch point um, uh, that could be expanded to other folks in departments that actually have more interaction um, as well. It's just very basic information, so it would follow very similar to the customer identification tool. More questions for me? Councilor Nolan, then we'll get back to you. Thank you. 
So Eric, you brought up one thing that really I think is important, and that was 1986, um, where they started looking into lead as being a, a main culprit in some issues. Um, my house was built in 1986. The lead was not part of the solder. It was something that came in that area because we were sensitive to it. Um, and if people understand that, you know, 86 is still young in a home. So it's very important for people to understand to have this checked. And I, I think what you're getting at is it will be checked and there's ways of doing it without being expensive or inconvenienced by people entering your home. So you guys are doing a great job. And uh, I want to thank you again. Yes, there, so there are multiple options on how to verify without having to do, there's no just, you don't have to take anything apart. It's all just visual. Um, uh, one other thing um, that you touched on was, um, so these letters are going to both the physical property owner and the property. So that for those that are uh, rental properties or the owners are, are at a different address, there is an attempt to get to both the physical address and the owner's address if they differ. Um, so there is some expectation that, like you said, there is gonna be instances where a letter should have been in the public hallway of, or, or in the hallway of a multi-unit. That is, that onus is on the property owner, but there are letters going to physical address in addition to owner's address to try and address that because the water department may not know the number of units because there's a single service not necessarily knowing that there's six units in the building. So again, that speaks to the departmental support because some other departments may know that. Councilor Grow. Uh, very quickly, will there be a public database available and will there be uh, an opportunity to uh, translate this into multiple languages so that people who live in the community that don't speak English as a major as their primary language, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, whatever, um, have access to this information as well. And also these letters are coming out next week I imagine that everyone in this council is going to be getting calls from this. Where do we direct them to calm nerves? Uh, we don't want any, any hair on fire. This is obviously an urgent situation, but it's not like. Yeah. Um, so the database is currently available through Dana's office at the water, water compliance. So you can, uh, the contact information is up on the screen, both phone and the, and the email address that goes to the main office. Um, plans to make it visible through either GIS, through the public GIS data, like we were talking about, and also providing a more search friendly version. I mean, it's a lot of, it's a big spreadsheet basically. Um, finding a way that it might be accessible through the city's website is, an, is another next step, just so that folks can go and search by street. Um, um, as far as language, um, that would just come down to just getting it to the right resources because the letters themselves are two to three pages long. So there's a decent amount of text um, and just in terms of like wanting to make sure that it's relatable. The state did not provide any uh, templates in alternate languages, unfortunately. That's all worthy. Thank you. Just a couple more. I appreciated Councilor Gross' question about multiple languages it's on my list. Um, we have people who could translate if necessary. So... I think we should probably consider that in some regard because there are people who won't know, even if they get a letter in English, they won't know. Um, I know with, and I am, I am not the real estate expert in the room here. I know we see a couple of people at the assessor's office and Ruth Pino is here, but when there's lead paint, there's notifications, there's, you can't sell your house with lead paint. Is there some test? Because as properties are sold, that may be another mechanism to trigger the testing of council. Recording. This is about water, not paint. So let's I, stay I know, on so topic, please, because that's that's not their that's not their. Um, I wasn't asking expertise. them about lead paint. I'm asking if there's a process where, through the real estate transactions, we can ask people to do lead testing in their water too. Okay. A disclosure, right? So if there's 4,600 or 4,300 houses, some of them will be sold this year. And maybe there's a mechanism to say, and can you get this test done either as a requirement or just simply as a notification? Because no one wants to buy a house that has lead coming into their water. I can't speak to where the legality of disclosure requirements, but there are communities considering putting in an, uh, a bylaw or ordinance that's similar to Title V at a property transaction. If you have a known 
lead or galvanized that that it has to be replaced as part of that transaction. We do, um, we do have an expert in the house who could add, uh, answer us if it's in the disclosure agreement. No, thank you. Right. I think I think most likely it's coming down to this is brand new requirements, so most people wouldn't. I mean, um, but there are communities trying to figure out like what do you do for those who don't opt into having it replaced? How do you guarantee that it comes out? Because the requirement is that it comes out by twenty thirty seven. If someone doesn't want to let the municipality or the water system take care of it because they're they're just saying no to any work on their property. Like at some point that has to come out um, by regulation. So some communities are considering some a backstop ordinance that says uh, at a transaction you could you could consider replacement at that time in order to get final sign off on the water bill or sewer bill or what have you. Thank you. When a community does figure that out, could you let us know so we could, um, I guess, copy and paste and just change the name to Gloss? I think that'd be helpful. Um, could there be wells that have lead pipes somehow in their home? People who are on wells. Uh, that would come down to just interior plumbing. Same same issue that all the properties are subject to, just based on age and materials. Ma mainly, it comes from the solder and some of the other things that were in just general plumbing fittings. But so, so it's yes, the same though as as people in public water supply. Are we able to test though? Is that part of a homeowner system. on a well could purchase a lead test kit for their home, but they're not considered a customer of the public water supplier that is the city of Gloucester. So they could be either an unknown or a lead. Uh, they would actually not be in the they're system at all. Yeah, they're not considered in our inventory because they're not a water customer. Yeah. This is addressing water customers. Right. I just think we have an obligation, everybody, in some regard. So I don't expect that to be your obligation. Yeah, I think that that's their obligation, yeah. you know, to... To know so what our they have. obligation, though, to figure out, to well, let them it's, know. It's their private property, so um, they're, they're not, um, yeah. they're not going to be, they're not subject think, to this. Right. I don't so. expect you to do doing that, but I just wonder if we as a council should be considering ways to. I don't think we can really dictate things on private property, but I don't want to keep going on this. Public health. I understand. Okay. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, council Major Victor. Quick question. Um, on the Gloucester Public Works, um, the, and I hate saying this, like the Facebook, the social media aspect, are you, not you, but your office will be saying something that these letters will be going out, or is there a link that you guys can do to sort of help us out? I think a lot of the ward counselors or, or counselors at large um, are able to get more out to the community by sharing um, this information to, you know, our followers, our constituents, so that way we'll be able, better able to communicate to them what's going on. Because I haven't seen anything on the uh, social media website yet, but I was hoping uh, that- Nothing has gone out via social media, and I think that's a good good idea. Um, we'll probably do that after the letters are, are being received. But uh, the link right here um, is to the water compliance webpage on the city website. We've got resources there. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna upload copies of the letters so that if folks are receiving them and they're wondering like, what is this? Is this a legitimate notification? Here's a copy of what we sent out. You can ver verify that yes, this was sent from us. Um, and that's got a frequently asked questions document. It's got links to education through EPA. Um, so that's where we'd like to direct folks is. Okay. If possible, um, my only suggestion is if we can get that possibly before the letters or the if you could time it so people would be like, okay, if I get this letter, this is what I can do, sort of like, so we're there, we're not like reacting. They could be, okay, I already got this information from my counselor. I got the letter, this is what I'm gonna do, so they're not surprised in sort of what to do or something, or calling us. We're sort of like trying to be like two steps ahead of them. Like, hey, you can get this letter. This is what the steps are based on what you guys have already said. We're just gonna try to share it with them. Letter, if possible. The letter does have the link to our website with all the resources. Um, I can work on the social media. That's like a small aspect. snippet so we can yeah. just send it. I know that you're busy. Snippet. Is it? I will say we also included a supplemental letter that the state allowed us to put in, which tries to boil it down into more of kind of like 
initial questions and concerns, which I would say the DEP letters don't really speak to because they're more from the causing concern through what some of the language they're using. We did put one in that kind of walks through some things, uh, very basic. So those are included in each of the, as a supplemental letter to each of those getting notified. Dana, have we seen the entire presentation? Because there may be. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> okay. Councilor right. oh, Gilman. Just a quick thought on communication. If you reach out to Ethan Foreman, it might be nice to get something on this topic in the newspaper because we still have a fairly good base of folks. He has been engaged. Great. We, we, Great. Thank engaged. you so much yeah. to both of you. Councilor Benson. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all your work. Uh, my question is like, how many letters do we have an estimate of how many letters are going out to households? Like the number? Uh, roughly speaking, that uh, 4,649. Just shy of 5,300. Yeah. And then 6,632, and then 12. Okay. That's just to, so people will understand so, yeah. like how many are coming, going on. Yeah, there was a total of almost 13,500 property records that were reviewed, and we ended up with that roughly the uh, 5,200 plus or minus are the ones that will be getting notified. In some of these properties, there are two letters because of because of the property the, the owner, property owner and doesn't and just to so clarify address, yeah, yeah. the property owner doesn't so actual know. letters. I don't know the number, but it it's more than that. That's what it, that's why I was trying to ask, and I knew it would, that. Yeah. And just uh, another, if I may, just another question is when we were talking about funding, looking at from the state and the federal government, the state received fifty million dollars from the federal government with the Infrastructure Act for removal of lead, lead service lines um, and the lead service line replacement program. Is there some of that that we as a municipality could get to help um, residents remove the lead? So um, the city's inventory program to date has actually been funded through a grant through some of those monies. Um, there is additional monies being made available to help with the verification um, what the state has provided is uh, special funding through the state revolving fund for the replacement program, which is really more putting it on the onus where that, that applicant would be the city. And then they do not, will not issue funding if you're only doing partial replacements. So if the city can't go and ask for state funding just to replace the city owned portion, it's, you got to replace the whole service if you want funds. So that is one of the strings that is attached. Um, the first projects that are getting funded through those additional infrastructure dollars uh, for lead service line replacement started in last year's program and will be continuing with the this summer, this past summer's applications, I'm sure saw an increase in the number of communities seeking to get replacement funds. Okay, just from my understanding, you would have to have the whole thing replaced to get the funding. It wouldn't be just city the city side here. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the state will not give you funds for partial replacements. Thank you. And um, there was another question, but the council president asked it at the beginning. Thank you. Um, there's 5,287 letters went out. They've been mailed. They should be. They were going in the mail today because the post office was closed yesterday. Did the um, do you have in that letter how people can try to access? Any of these, because you said the drinking water, um, I wrote down plus, but that's trust. The drinking water plus? Trust. Trust. Is it, are you talking about right funding? It? For funding? Yeah. Uh, funding, no, no. Right now it is more on uh, public health related items for the lead and galvanized due to the potential exposure. Um, uh, the unknown is gives additional information just on how to verify the material of your service line. Uh, but it's not related to funding. It's just related to this is the information that the water system has currently for your property. Yeah, because um, I read an article today that uh, it's nationally it's going to be you know close to forty billion dollars for homeowners, not for municipalities in the nation. So it, it's going to be putting a considerable burden on people who really can't shoulder the burden anymore, and we need to figure out some way to try to get access since the, the state's making us do it. Did you send a cover letter? 
explaining that the city of Gloucester was not responsible for this? So there is a supplemental letter that touches on just like some of that FAQ style information and leads them to the same information. Um, it does get into some of the nuance that there is a privately owned side of a service and a publicly owned side, um, which I'm sure a lot of folks don't understand that there is a demarcation as to who does what, similar to you run into the same thing with sewer laterals um, oftentimes. Um, yeah, we know a lot about water lines. So, <laughs> yeah, so it is, it, is, it is mentioned as part of that. Um, I think we can put up Dana's graphic on the website too, just so that it's clear where that line yeah, of ownership no, is. Really, my question was: did it, was it included in there that, that this was not initiated by us? This was a federal yes, that state. is yes. And, and all public water suppliers are doing this right now, so it's right. going to be confusing and overwhelming. Um, but we're not the only ones doing this, and everyone's kind of navigating these next steps together. It's. Councilor Grow, did you have a question? Uh, I'm good. All right. Any more questions? Yep. Do we know predominantly what part of town these letters are going? Jeff, to? Jeff asked that. Okay. So they don't. We'll, they don't yet. They don't yet. Okay. We'll look at the geographic distribution shortly. I think anecdotally, it's throughout. And can you send us this PowerPoint yep. and the letter? Well, all yeah, three letters. All three letters and the supplemental letter, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> all right, if there's nothing, nothing more, thank you very much for this because we're going to definitely be getting lots of questions on it. You guys make things up. Thank you. Carol. Yeah. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Confirmation of new appointments. Councilor Nolan. So we have in the Gloucester Cultural Council, Sally Jackson, fulfilling an unexpired term, term to end 2-15-25. Um, Sally has come before the Ordinance Administration Committee with a vote totally in favor. Um, she can't make it tonight. I feel as though Sally's well known throughout the council, being a alternate member, and I'm fairly confident um, to put her up for a recommendation tonight without any objection. She has been um, sworn in, I believe, and everything else is in, in good shape. So with that being said, on a motion by Council Majota, seconded by Council Grace, the Ordinance Administration Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend the City Council appoint Sally Jackson for filling an unexpired term to the City Council, to the Gloucester Culture Council, term to end 215-2025, and now so moved. Second. Motion made by Councilman Nolan, seconded by Councilman Mijoto. Did you read? Um, so that's the, any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? None. The ayes have it. Eight to zero, one absent. And next order of business, Madam Clerk. The consent agenda. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent agenda? Yes. Okay, Councilor Grow. Uh, number one, under communications invitations, please. Okay. Anything else we want to remove? All right, let's, um, we'll have a vote on the consent agenda, or I move that we um, adopt. adopt the consent so moved. agenda. Moved by Councillor Gilman. Second. Second by Councillor Worthley. All those in favor, uh, um, as without the... Uh, without the number one. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, eight to zero, one absent. Councilor Grow. Yeah, uh, this uh, Human Rights Commission resolution um, would normally come back to us at the next uh, city council meeting as the second appearance on the, on the calendar. Um, at, a, at the request of the HRC and also uh, to coincide with Human Rights Day, 
Uh, I'm asking that it be continued to the first meeting in December, which would be December 10th, um, which is basically just the meeting after this. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah, uh, seeing none, the ayes have it, eight to zero, uh, one absent. Next order, business, Madam Clerk. November 7th budget and finance standing committee report. Okay. We had a whole bunch of, um, of contractual obligations that we just um, are fulfilling our financial obligation to that. It's a lower number than it was because there's several positions that we still haven't been able to fill. The job market out there is really, really hard. Um, so I'd like to take these as a consent agenda. Oh yeah, number one, sorry. Vote, vote yours too. We can, we can do them all as one consent agenda. So there's the, um, um, Council Worthley, you wanna make the motions? Sure, each of the motions, or is it consent this, agenda? Um, consent agenda. Oh yeah, consent, consent, consent agenda. agenda, sorry. I don't know what, something's wrong with me. This cold is killing me. Um, any discussion on the consent agenda for these items? Yep. I'd like if you could just read the little blurb for one and two, just so the public is aware of what we're approving. We don't have to go right. through the motion, we can, we right. can wait. Down. Yep, we have a memorandum from the city clerk requesting transfer of funds in order to pay for workers to staff the early voting period on Saturday, October 9th, Thursday, October 24th, from 4 to 6 p.m., Saturday, October 26th, and Thursday, October 31st, from 4 to 6 p.m., in the amount of $800, and this money is coming from the um, savings that we had by a position that was not available, that has not been fulfilled, filled. And the other one is a memorandum from the chief financial officer to um, fund the GMA contract obligation and department head wage scale changes in the amount of $55,000. Discussion? Council Worthley. Yes, um, on the discussion, and this one is partly a question. Um, Grace, the $800 is not the total cost for the early voting, that's the additional cost, correct? Correct. It's just for those days. I had originally planned on having staff staff the early voting for that, but it just got so crazy busy in our office that it wasn't going to work. So I needed to hire some more um, early voting workers to staff the two Saturdays and the Thursday afternoons. And if I could comment on the the first part of that motion of the um, the transfer for the funds for the GMA GMMA contract. Mm -hmm. Is it GMAA or GMA? Gloucester Municipal Managers Association. Um, so we had put, the mayor had requested the Budget and Finance Committee to put $125,000 into contingency fund in the mayor's line item budget, in, under the mayor's line item, sorry. And um, it was to negotiate in good faith and have the money set aside in advance of negotiations. That contract expired on September 1st and was renewed or you know, settled on September 4th. And we are not spending as much because, partly because we haven't filled some of the positions. Um, and so of the $125,000 set aside, we're asking to transfer $55,000 into individual line items in the budget to bring those contracts uh, in compliance with the new settled contract. That makes sense. I, I can answer more questions than that if anybody has them. So I'd be supporting that. Um, I, I think that we, this is the third transfer regarding, that we've approved regarding election costs. I believe there have been three. Yeah, yeah, it was. We had, we did, we had to do three that to the cost just kept going up. And fortunately, we have this buffer because they've been having to work extra hard without having that. Um, person on staff or office that's staffed minimally anyway. 
All right, that's it. We need a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Motion made by Council Gilman, seconded by Council Worthley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes eight to zero uh, with one absence. Next order of business. November 4th, Ordinances and Administration Standing Committee Report. There's no action tonight. We have info on our report. We do have coming up uh, Gloss Dakota Ordinance Chapter 2 Administration Article 3, um, which is from Worthley looking into the amount of buildings that may be built or may not be built if there is an overlay district, and that will be continued until December 2nd, 2024. Councilor Nolan, there's another item. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Then there's another one, um, CC 2024-016, MEMHOG, um, to amend GCO Chapter 22, Section 22-271, resident sticker parking only by Adden Hammond Street. Um, this uh, has been withdrawn without prejudice. Do you vote on that? Double to withdraw without prejudice? Next order of business. November 6th, Planning and Development Standing Committee report. Uh, thank you very much. Um, basically, we reviewed uh, the Main Street application, City Council Permit 2024-003 Main Street number 20. Um, we are going to be having, as noted, a Committee of the Whole on November 20th, so the next uh, uh, P&D meeting. I, I believe we're going to have it here in the, in the auditorium. Um, I would really would invite uh, city councilors to review that um, uh, meeting. A lot of questions were asked and answered. A lot of concerns were raised and addressed by the applicant um, and also by the third party reviewers. Um, we were, are not going to have uh, Greg Katamatori come back and redo a presentation on the third party review. That's all there in the, in the recording. So I'm, I'm just encouraging you to take the time to go through what we've already done so that we're not repeating uh, uh, steps unnecessarily. And, you know, most importantly, bring questions you have for the, uh, for the application and the applicant. And if you have constituents concerns, uh, we will not be taking uh, public input at that meeting that's going to save for that public hearing. But certainly they are welcome to ask you questions to ask at the, at the subcommittee meeting so that we can get to the, uh, the full depth of what we need to know before we make a decision. So that's it for that. That's next uh, November 20th, next Wednesday. The president asked a question of the PD chair. Yep. Would it be appropriate for counselors who have questions argue for the applicant to submit them somehow in advance so they don't have to, yep. have to be bombarded? Absolutely. With so in fact, if you have questions from constituents, you can, for you can either forward them to me and I will forward them to the applicant, or you can, for I mean, that makes the most sense, but. And please, if you could do it in enough time for them to answer. So if we can get them by the end of the week, um, that would give them the weekend and a couple of days to get through uh, uh, any any questions they might. It might not mean that they need to email the answers, but they could be prepared to answer them at the meeting. Right. right. What, what they did before was that they, they uh, uh, we had a full two pages of questions that were submitted to the applicant, who then submitted a copy of her answers back again, which we read through and, and explained. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, all those in favor? Oh, there's, oh, there's no motion, motion yet? Oh, that's right. We're in, I'm in favor. Yep. Sorry, I'm telling you. I don't know what happened today. It's okay. Take the last Public hour. Public Tax classification. You're done. There's no more. Uh, next order of business, Madam Clerk. Public hearing 2024 number 16, SCP 2024 number 3, the application of 20 Main LLC for the demolition and conversion of an office building to multifamily housing containing 24 units and a retail space at Main Street number 20, Map 7, Lot 94 in the CB District. So this matter is continued to finally and 
a date that it will be before us. Um, it's November 26, 2024. So it's an open public hearing as um, right now. Next is public hearing 2024, number 35, tax classification in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5, and GCO, Chapter 2, Section 2-26 to determine the percentage of the local tax levy for the fiscal year 2025 to be borne by each class of real and personal property. And I will open the public hearing. Those who would like to um, speak in favor or give a presentation, I think is more what it will be. The handheld, yes, those don't, those don't work. They're not hooked up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Nancy Pappas, Principal Assessor. Also present are Gary Johnstone and Tim Good Assessor. Um, we're here basically to give information prior to the public hearing. The fiscal 25 assessed values and new growth were approved by the Department of Revenue on October 18th, 2024. This will Nancy, just one second. Um, all the information that this is on the BNF packet from November 7th. So if you could go to the BNF packet on November 7th, you will have her pres the presentation that was given to us at BNF, and it will be really helpful to follow along. Thank you. Thank you. This allows us to move forward with the tax classification process. There are four options to consider, none of which change the total tax levy. As there are no parcels classified as open space and the mayor has not chosen to adopt either the residential exemption or the small commercial exemption, the focus is on determining whether or not to shift a portion of the tax levy from one class of property to another. To do so, a residential factor must be adopted. This factor determines the share of the tax levy that each class of property will bear. Page four shows the total value and percentage of each class. The residential class makes up 91.58% of the total value and the CIP class 8.42%. The taxable value of the city increased just over 4% from fiscal 24. Based on the sales analysis, the residential class as a whole saw market adjustments of approximately 3%. And property types within the residential class ranged from approximately 2.5% to 5.75%. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Nancy, but can you or any of your staff forward this presentation to the uh, city clerk so we can put it up? The so, presentation, I'm on the class packet that was already given. No, I understand that, but this for the viewers at home so they can see what we're talking about. It's, it, yeah, it is. I was just. Not permission. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Trying to be as transparent as possible. So property types within the residential class saw market adjustments in the range of two two and a half percent roughly to 5.75. Market adjustments to the single family class were approximately 2.75 percent. Two and three family class, 3.25 percent. The apartment class, 2.5 percent. And condominium class, 5.75 percent. The commercial class as a whole saw market adjustments of approximately 2.5% and market adjustments to the residential class, I mean, I'm sorry, to the industrial class as a whole were approximately 3%. So overall, slightly higher market adjustments on the residential side, but much closer and more similar than in past years on a class basis. Page five shows the parcel counts and assessed values of each class from 2012 to the present. 
And if you look at the bottom of the page on the packet, from fiscal 24 to fiscal 25, you're gonna see a slight decrease in the residential class percentage and a slight increase in the CIP class percentage. This is due in part to the market adjustments being more similar with the classes and also due to growth, um, considerable growth in the personal property class for fiscal 25. Page six shows the historic shift factors adopted over the years, and it's the underlying residential factor associated with the shift that is voted on. Page seven is the calculation of the maximum allowable levy. It starts with the fiscal 24 levy limit. This is reduced by amended fiscal 24 new growth. Added to that is the prop two and a half increase. Residential new growth and commercial industrial and personal property new growth. This results in the fiscal 25 levy limit Added to that are the debt exclusions, the CSO debt, the water debt, and East Veterans Elementary. With that addition, the result is the maximum allowable levy for fiscal 25, and that number divided by the total value of all parcels results in a tax rate at a factor of one of 9.75, which is rounded downward not to exceed the maximum allowable levy. The tax rate at a factor of one is only a penny down from fiscal 24. The reason for this is the increases or market adjustments that were made are basically offset by the prop two and a half increase. A factor of one results in the same tax rate for all classes of property and any factor other than one shifts a portion of the levy to another class. Page eight shows the approximate tax rates that result from the various shifts to the CIP class, and the maximum shift allowed by the state is 1.5. Page nine shows a comparison of levies by class at various shift factors. The tax rates are approximate and rounded, so as not to exceed the maximum allowable levy. And the far right-hand corner shows the difference in tax levy each class will bring in after the shift. Page 10 shows changes in tax dollars for properties valued at different levels at various shifts. It shows the savings to the residential taxpayers and the increase in tax dollars for CIP taxpayers. For fiscal 25, the average single-family home is valued at $948,997. The median single family is valued at $668,800. And the average residential value is $778,945. So in looking in the property value column of $750,000, if you were looking at a 1.03 shift, it would result in an annual savings to the residential taxpayer of $15, while the CIP taxpayer would pay an additional $217.50. The maximum shift of 1.5 is illustrated at the bottom of the page, and in that same column, there would be a savings to the residential taxpayer of $337.50 while the CIP taxpayer would pay an additional $3,660. The remainder of the packet explains the open space discount and the residential and small commercial exemptions, which are not viable options this year. As I indicated, both Gary and Tim are here. We'll do our best to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Gilman. So. Um, oh, oh, no, we're going to make a motion first. Sorry. Oh, true. Public hearing. Oh, public oh, hearing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What the hell am I talking about? Yeah. Sorry. Anyone else would like to speak in, um, in favor? Uh, 
Um, anyone would like to speak in, in opposition? Oh, did you want to speak in favor? Or? Um, the recommendation is to adopt a residential tax factor of 99.997200. It equates to a CPI shift of 1.3, 1.03. So it's, it's it's the same as it is today, 1.03. So that that's what we'll be that's what we'll be voting on, and what are dependent upon amendments. So yep, go ahead, Steve. Um, so, uh, Before you start, I, um, Councilman Nolan had an emergency he had to attend to. Hello, um, my name is Stephen Buckley. I live at 6 Puerto Drive in Gloucester, Mass, and I am the CEO of the Greater Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce. So I do feel that I offer a unique perspective, actually um, three perspectives, one as a homeowner and a taxpayer, one as the CEO of the Greater Cape Ann Chamber, but also I run a small business. So I look at it three different ways. Um, obviously, listening to our members, listening to the presentation, and doing my research, both what Gloucester historically, I know a lot of it is presented here, but also what um, our surrounding communities are doing. And I know our surrounding communities, our members um, of the chamber, our communities are they have tax parity. So the Gloucester is unique in that we are the only community in Greater Cape Ann that we represent that has the different tax, tax classification for businesses already. And I think that is important to note. Uh, as you all know, the vast majority of Gloucester businesses are small businesses, actually about 95% of Gloucester businesses are small businesses. And I think it's uh, pretty obvious that most small businesses are struggling. And I know running a small business that every single expense matters. And, you know, as Nancy pointed out with the differentials, what might be um, a couple of lattes for a homeowner like myself, um, 200, every time it goes up a little bit, that $250 is a lot. And we know from the chamber, because when people saying, I can't afford my membership, I had to cut this expense out. That $200, the $500, the $1,000 is significant for people that are trying to keep the lights on. So I think that really has to be put into perspective that that, that is the business community that we represent. And it's as you can see with the numbers, it's a small amount of the overall tax base. And actually, um, sadly, the amount seems to be shrinking. And I think we need to keep an eye on that. And obviously, my job is to advocate for businesses because I'm listening to businesses every day and running a small business. So I think we, we have to think about also what our businesses are contributing in other ways, obviously the vibrancy of our community, but um, also significant amount of revenue. When we look at our summer season review and the figures that come in, our businesses and local options taxes are contributing approximately $3 million to the city. So we need those businesses to be here and we need them to contribute in the ways that they contribute. So I urge the council to consider that, consider the small businesses who also, most of them live here and they understand they are paying taxes like myself. So I urge you to consider that and um, take that into consideration when you're looking at that um, tonight and voting on it. It's important, it's important to the small businesses and to keep them here because with inflation and the costs and everything that's going on out there, Every dollar really does matter to these small businesses. Thank you very much for your time, councilors. Thank you. Um, we have to limit the next speakers to three minutes. No, no, you had you had the the big you, you did the big opposition time frame. Um, I'll keep this short. My name is Tony Sapienza. I'm uh, owner of the Blue Shutters Beach Side Inn, uh, an accommodation <clears throat> on uh, One Nautilus Road. I'm also a past president of the chamber uh, in 2020, uh, current member of the chamber's board of directors, 
and um, I'm chair of the Chambers Tourism Council. Um, I'm here to um, speak in support of business tax uh, classification parity. Uh, echo much, much of what um, Steve had to say. I feel that the shift that's being discussed is, is truly unfair to the business community and ill-advised for the city as a whole for a lot of the points that Steve made. Um, you know, as a homeowner, I can understand the desire to manage the tax burden for the little guy. But as one of the councils pointed out in last week's meeting, the Gloucester businesses that are being asked to shoulder more of the tax burden are little guys as well. Local business owners who employ locals. And given that there are many more homeowners that would be affected versus the relatively small number of businesses, the impact, I think, unfairly burdens the business community. Uh, I'm one of those businesses. Um, I was also the chamber president during uh, during COVID and saw the, the struggles that that caused um, the business community. We're still reeling from it. And any additional burden is is really, um, really unnecessary, I think. Um, I've come to also come to understand the financial challenges the business face, you know, of all the accommodations, the restaurants and attractions that are part of the um, the tourism community that give back to uh, this community. Um, I, you know, I think the shift that we're considering make more sense for communities that have a larger commercial base, it just doesn't seem to make sense for the Gloucester business community. And for this reason, I urge you to um, consider the tax, the, the tax classification parity. Um, you know, just remind us a difficult time for businesses uh, added unnecessary pressures you know, to those of us who are struggling today. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks to all of you who came yesterday to the Vietnam Memorial Service. Um, I'm Ruth Pino, I live at 82 Wheeler Street and I was a past president of the chamber. But on page five, that's what I always like for you to really pay attention to and see the differential between residential and commercial. So try not to think about personal property. Just look at the commercial industrial and see over time how short it, it's become. And we have to protect our small businesses. It's where our kids go to work. It's who uh, donates gift cards to everything that happens. They support our community. We need to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Don't see anyone online. And did we get any communications, Madam Clerk? We did not. Okay. Questions from the counselors to the applicants and staff. Jason Grow. Nancy, can I have a quick question? I'm going to bloviate later on in a bit, but I've, I do have a couple quick questions. Can you speak a little bit to the... Um, the percent, the significant changes in the personal property uh, assessments for um, not only this year, but also I think as far back as 2022, I'm trying to look at my numbers here. There seem to be two jumps, um, especially this year. Yes. Um, going back between 20 and 21, I believe, in terms of fiscal years, the state required us to change the methodology methodology in terms of the 504 utilities, which are like Boston Gas, Mass Electric. Um, in doing that, there was a spike in the increase in value on those two accounts. Um, this past year, there was actually growth based on a project completed by Mass Electric, and that was considerable. So there's a value increase just on Boston Gas and Mass Electric of 32 million almost, which is why that figure from 24 to the um, 25 figure is so significantly higher. Those are fairly uh, they're sort of outliers in, in, the, in the normal scheme of things. Yes. Well, the other question I wanted to get to, and I, I, I brought this up last year, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more too, uh, is that 
the issue of, of residential uh, assessments are going up at a far significantly faster rate than commercial industrial and generally speaking the personal property which except for those two outlying years is the effect on that that the you, despite the shift the, the commercial and the industrial uh, percentages of the levy, levy have gone down relative to that I'm, I'm looking at my sort of numbers which I'm happy to have corrected that between 2019 and 2025 residential levy uh, went up to like 3.8 percent uh, excuse me 3.87 percent per year uh, 3.68 as much as 5.27 and 3.82 whereas during those same years commercial uh, was at 0 0.29 0 0.74 1.2 uh, as part of the total levy in fact in in a couple of years ago commercial and uh, went down 1.59 percent and down 3.35 percent and similar in the industrial, uh, in fact, more, more pronounced in industrials. Does that effectively nullify the, the, what we're doing in terms of the tax shift and put more obligation on the residential taxpayers? Over time, if you look back, we've, in the real estate market, and that's what we're basically measuring what's happening with um, sales, we've been seeing increasing values on the residential side since roughly fiscal 14. They've been more significant in various years, and especially the past few, not counting this one. Mm -hmm. um, that impacts the value of that class at a greater rate than commercial industrial, which that market is a little bit more stable. It's a financial decision based on um, investor expectations. So the commercial industrial is typically more stable. So. The residential, if, if that class is a larger class to begin with and increasing at a faster pace, is going to be bringing in a larger piece of the pie just based on that. Nothing to do with shift, per se. Right, right. I guess the, because the shift is so inconsequential that, it, that it, it's all, for all intents and purposes, it's a 1.0. But I, I'm looking at the commercial and the, and the industrial especially. There are year, if, if you look at time over year, 2018 to today, they're paying 0.09% more in the total levy as a class for commercial, and you're, you're actually seeing a minus 3% in the amount the industrial uh, properties are paying as a class, whereas on the residential side, we're looking at 27.74% uh, of, of that increase. I'm, I guess I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, we talk about the shifts as being really rough on co commercial and industrial properties. But in fact, we're having a different kind of shift back in terms of the fact that the residentials are picking up what the commercial and industrial classes are not paying. Residential, basically because of the higher percentage and the higher increases in value, their percentage of the pie has been increasing. This is the first kind of, you know, we, we talked about the two little blips um, in terms of the personal property. Um, so what I think you're talking about is more the natural natural shift that occurs when you look at just what we have as a makeup of a city. The residential value, that includes um, any market adjustments as well as any growth. You know, and there's more, there's more growth in the residential class than there is in the commercial industrial as well. Right, but I guess when people talk about their taxes going up, um, they're going up at a, at, a, at a faster clip than commercial and industrial. If you're in a year, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about specific properties, but if you're, looking at, if you're looking at year to year and one class is having more significant market adjustments, which has been happening with the residential class um, over time, then they are most likely, those increases are higher than the the average in some cases. So if we're saying the residential class is seeing like a 10% increase in one year and commercial industrial is only seeing two, they are going to be paying more in taxes as a class and, and individually most likely if, if their property is responding similar to what the class is doing. Councilor Gilman. 
So I'm not sure if Jill Cahill is still on the phone, yep. um, but I would be interested in the mayor's recommendation of 1.03 and why that was the recommendation. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, right now, the most important thing to the mayor is stability and predictability. Um, we've been at the 1.03 uh, in order to give both businesses and residents some some predictability on, on what to expect again, because as Nancy was saying, some of the um, sh some of the the changes happen through the market that we can't control. This is the one area that we have some can offer our residents and our business owners and our property owners some predictability. Thank you. Council oh, Grow. Sorry to belabor you with this stuff. Again, throwing my uh, the numbers into the spreadsheets, the calculations basically look as if over time for say the last 20 years, 21 years, the relatively the relative ratio between residential and CIP has been 90-10. That's would you would you would you sort of agree with that? Yes. Is there a mechanism by which we can we can maintain that ratio? So that as prices in the residential uh, uh, class continue to rise, and commercial industrial, I mean, it's, we've seen a little 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 blip up this year, but it's not typical. Uh, continue to to stable be stable. Shift some of that responsibility back to the commercial industrial properties. What we're talking about with classification that is possible. There are communities that that is their rationale for potentially wanting to shift in terms of keeping um, a stable amount of the total percentage that each class is bringing in. The issue with our, in, on page eight, if you were to look at that and you wanted to maintain the 90 for the residential, we're talking about a pretty significant shift of almost 1.2. And the danger in a community like ours is that a significant shift like that onto a very small portion of the populace, which would be the CIP class, if you go to page 10 and look at the 1.2, you're gonna see that the savings to the resident is still only $135 a year for that $750,000 property, while the CIP taxpayer will pay $1,470 $70 on an annual basis. So you have to keep in mind the impact that you would have on the commercial class where it's so much smaller in terms of the piece of the pie. But there's a way to achieve it within the shift um, if that's the policy that somebody, you know, proposes or, um, you know, different communities, like I say, there's lots of different reasons why they shift or don't. Um, and that is one of the ones that I know that some communities have tried to adhere to. I guess, I, again, I'm looking at these numbers and I'm looking back at 2018 and I'm looking at the valuation of the, the uh, commercial class. The total valuation was 351927000 It's gone up um, to four, um, sorry, 468785000 but the total levy that is levied on the commercial properties has gone up $9,541 if you subtract in 2018 from 2025. They're paying exactly the same amount of taxes as they were six, year, six years ago, seven years ago. Are we in question period or are we? I'm asking a question. As, as someone who's, yeah. I was asking you. Um, is it would it, it right? I know there's a lot of it, but is there a way to do this incrementally over time so that we we manage to create a, a, a more stable platform for residences to know that they're they're going to carry ninety percent of the tax base, and CIP is going to carry ten percent of the tax base. Tax classification in general is at the. Um, it is for the city council to decide with the approval of the mayor. So each year we're basically, you know, at a factor of one, anything is available in terms of what you want to recommend um, or vote on for that matter. So we're never probably going to see anything higher than the ability to shift over 1.5, which would be a massive change 
Um, but every increment in between is available every year at this time. Thank you. Um, following that, I mean, what I'm seeing is in the valuation on page four that it is strictly percentage of the burden is strictly by valuation and residential, unfortunately for us, 91.8% of our tax revenue comes from residential. That's basically because in Massachusetts, as you know, ad valorem tax, if it was a factor of one with all properties having the same tax rate, it's just based on value. And our residential class this year is that 91.58. And that hasn't changed dramatically as Councillor Groh mentioned over time. We've, we've been consistently in the 90-10 range. And now it's down to 8.42, which is lower than what you were saying. What did you use the residential? No, the valuation is. So even in, you know, at one, they're still going to be, or at, you know, the residential valuation is higher. And that's, you know, that's just the value is what it is. Which means they're paying a higher percentage of the overall taxes. No, they period. own a higher percentage of the value. Which means they're paying more. Interest. Because they own. I, I appreciate that. I understand that. I'm just Councilor Worthley. Clear. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. First of all, thank you for your presentation, Nancy. You always do a fine job, a great job. Um, I'm going to ask some rhetorical questions that maybe you have the answers to. And if you don't, then you don't obviously have to answer them. To... Um, any students in Gloucester School have a business address as a home address? Any students in the school, I would not know. Okay. Is it likely, in your opinion? That they live at a business, that's probably unlikely. Okay. So when a business owner pays the taxes that they pay, um, the city takes the income from that and doesn't necessarily have the additional expense of a student in school. Is that correct? If it's not an owner-occupied business, they could be owner-occupied and have children in the schools or not. Do uh, business owners pay, uh, I'm sorry, do, does the city cover the trash removal costs for businesses? Trash removal, I do know that businesses pay for their own trash removal. Okay, and obviously residents pay too, but we, the city subsidizes some of that. Is that your understanding? Most residential do pay, but depending on the number of units, I live in a condominium building, building, and once you have a certain number of units, you pay for your own trash as well. Mike Hale has told us in the past that the amount of money that people pay for trash bags doesn't cover the city's cost. I just see that businesses pay 100% of the trash removal where um, residents don't pay 100% of the trash removal. The city covers a portion of that. Um, when you have a property like the Halyard, valued at $60 million that gets developed and added to the tax, tax evaluation. Um, how could we use our tax classification policy to adjust for something like that? Or should we even be in the business of adjusting our tax factor based on what happens in the general marketplace of business and residential? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. Halyard is part of the residential class, so the value is in there. And at a factor of one, it would be picking up its fair share in terms of based on value. Um, any shift that occurs, if there were a shift to the CIP class, whatever savings would come their way, they would get the same type of savings that any residential taxpayer would get. Just that we heard the conversation about the, the valuations have gone up, but part of that evaluations are the valuations are new growth. Yes. $60 million halyard on the residential side. That's not that everyone's evaluation went up, valuation went up, but there's the additional new growth that adds to the total levy that we see in this chart. Is that correct? It is. And then the, the halyard themselves, their assessed value, they're basically carrying that growth because it's in their value and it's going to be multiplied by the tax rate. Exactly. So they're covered, they're covering their own expenses. But I'm just saying, in terms of the evaluation, we can't control using tax factor, the tax factor, whether or not the new development happens. No. And that change, the, the development is what changes these numbers more than anything else. It's a combination of market and development. Um, sometimes it's, you know, some of the new growth are when people maybe convert a multifamily to condominium units. 
you're going to see more value for several individual entities. Um, sometimes it's lot splits. You also see it on the commercial side. You know, there was recently an industrial building that was converted to condominium. So new growth in any class is new construction, or it could be something new that's taxable for the first time based on a conversion, new prop personal property accounts, things of that nature. So I think what I'm hearing is that it would be difficult in retrospect to use tax classification as a way to adjust the evaluations or the total levy. I don't think that those would, would actually correlate in any meaningful way. The tax, um, tax classification is really to determine the portion of the levy that each class is going to pay. The values are the values. That's what's been approved by the Department of Revenue. Thank you very much. Um, I have one more question, or I could probably just work it into my testimony. Um, like one more question then for Nancy. We saw the average numbers, but I'd asked earlier, I don't know if you have it off the top of your head, what would be the median tax savings for a property owner, a residential property owner, if we did a shift? from 1.00 to 1.03. Do you remember the email that you sent to me? Are you talking about median residential value? Median residential tax bill. Do no, I don't, I don't think I, I know I gave you some information about re uh, median residential values and savings based on the shift versus what CIP would, would pay. The number, dollar number, eleven dollars and ninety-seven cents, sound familiar to you? So, so that is what you're speaking of. Yes, I have it here somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I'll shift of one point zero C would save the median residential taxpayer less than twelve dollars. Correct. Year. Correct. Year. And, okay. So, and in that case, the median business owner would absorb additional expenses of one hundred thirty-six dollars and forty-two cents. Yes, it's save eleven ninety-seven. It's very similar to page 10. Right. The values are a little bit different. Yeah, I asked for the medians versus... Um, she gave the median, though. This, this was residential value that Councillor Worthley asked for, not single family, per se. Yeah, but um, it, good. She, gave the, she gave the medium number, and you can just do the math pretty simply there. Just, she gave me some other additional information I want to share with the council. So. 1197 was the dollar amount saved by the median homeowner with a shift of 1.03. Is that correct, Nancy? It's median residential value, so that includes vacant land, um, single families, apartments, anything that's in the residential class. Thank you for that. I have no more questions for Nancy. Appreciate it. Question, Val. So I've got just some questions to make sure that I'm understanding this. And um, Grace, if you wouldn't mind putting up um, page number 10, because it seems to be a popular one. But in looking at the mean values that you've given us in one of the other pages, um, a single family home that is the most popular one is a mean value of 948 thousand dollars which is an increase of 3.36 percent right and we have there are 7,244 people in Gloucester that have a house of that value right so it's 3.36 an increase in mean value so you're looking councillor Gilman at the mean and median pages at the back yeah. So, so basically, the parcel, the property class column to the far left, the parcel count is the total number of single families. Right. So the mean value is just the average of all those values. Okay. So I'm not necessarily saying there's a certain number at that value. That's just the average of all single families divided by the total number. Okay. So with waterfront parcels that we have, you know, we have a lot of things on the upper end. That's why the mean is higher than the median. Okay. The median being the 668, 800 is probably a better indicator, but this is also not saying specifically how many of those there are. It's the midpoint. Okay. So you're gonna have equal amounts below and above that 668, eight. Okay, but if we, if we do use that and then we look back at page 10 and we look to 1.03. Yes. Basically, 
that's very close to 948,000, which is the average mean value, the mean value, right? So yes, you could look at either column, the 750 or the million. Okay, so let's, let's look at a million because 948 is closest okay. to the million. And what we're saying in, in this chart is that um, if, you, if your house is worth that much money or valued at that much money, and we go with the 1.03, we're gonna be, that particular taxpayer will be saving $15 per year. On the $750,000 home, on the million, it would be a $20 savings. Okay, so, that, so that's, that's the savings. Yes. And now if we were to take a look at the commercial, um, which the average is 1.227, and there are 304, the mean is right, which is a 2.9% increase. So if you if you look at that and you bring that down to this chart again, the same chart on page 10, what we're saying is that particular um, commercial owner of which there are 304 in Gloucester, they're they're going to have to pay 217 dollars more a year. If their property value was 750. So when you're looking at the mean, the closest thing we have on this chart is the million. So if you just went over to the far right, commercial property with a value of a million would be paying an extra $290 on an annual basis. Okay. Um, those questions are just kind of helpful to look at it in terms of what the averages are. So um, I yep. just wanted to make sure that I understood this. No problem. You're welcome. Council so Grow. Good question, Nancy. Um, do you know offhand sort of the average new growth we've had in the last, say, seven years? And you're talking about tax dollars, I assume. Whatever the tax dollars growth calculation is, yeah. So this year was a little bit higher because of what we talked about with the um, personal property. And it's about close to 1.4, 1.378. And that's um, also on that page seven with the calculation of the maximum allowable levy. Um, the prior year, this is all classes. Prior year was a million one, which is closer to what I kind of expected this year with if that personal property blip didn't occur. Um, the prior year was 1.3. In fiscal 22, it was 1.6. And that's I that's the increase in, in tax about that. Amount. That's the tax dollars of new growth, not the value. You know, offhand, what, what the what the valuation, say for residential, was in 2018 versus 2025. No, no, I don't. <laughs> Would you be surprised to learn we have valued that by four, an increase in four billion dollars in the residential side? I know it's gone up considerably. And in the uh, commercial and industrial, the CIP in general has gone up 278 million over that same period of time. I'm just making the point that, that again, that the, the residential seems to be clipping along at a, at a much higher rate, including with Halyard, but Halyard was to be considered a kind of a, a blip in the uh, residential component as well as the national grid and, and utilities in the, in the personal property, right? I mean, that's not typical. No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions? I'll close the public hearing. Committee report. Um, yes, please. Okay, committee report on motion of Council Memhart, second by myself. The budget and finance committee, committee voted by roll call, three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend the City Council adopt a residential tax classification factor of 0 0.997200 that equates to a CIP shift of 1.03 for fiscal year 2025, and I so move. Motion made by Council Worthley, seconded by Council Majota. Council President. Discussion. Yes. I'd like That's to make a motion to amend that number to 1.18. 1.18. 1 That's correct. Okay. 
There's an, a motion on the table. Anybody want to second it? Second. Okay. Motion made. Uh, motion for the amendment made by Councillor Grow, seconded by Councillor Benson. On the on the on the amendment. On the amendment. As as I've already made the made the case, I think in in, the, in my questions, the residential component of our tax base is is clipping along at a much higher pace than commercial, industrial, and, and personal property. I think, and I made this point last year, that we ought to be sort of trying to skew our rates to a ratio of 90-10, which has been our historic average for the last 20-something years. A, a move to 1.18 would be a dramatic shift compared to what we've been doing at 1.03, which I think, frankly, is such a token as to be pointless. And um, I expect that I'll be voting against a 1.03 shift basically just on the principle. But I guess my, my point on this is that what I hear on a regular basis uh, through phone calls, people in the street, social media, is residents are feeling taxed out. And even though this is not a tremendous savings for any additional um, uh, resident, you know, we, we like, I hear it all the time in this council, every little bit helps. You know, if we can, if we can help the residents, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna help the residents. Well, here's a chance where we help the residents and shifting that to the commercial industrial, I agree, it feels extreme. But if you look at historically over the last seven, eight years, they are paying effectively less taxes than they were been paying a year on. If you, if you factor in not only the fact that their, their rates have stayed the same and their valuations have not gone, gone up very much, but also inflation factors. So they're actually getting a tax savings that we are not affording the residents. Um, and I'm happy to be corrected on that for the, for, the, for the numbers. I think we need to make a statement at some point that we need, to, we need to rebalance the scales a little bit and move it so that residential compo component remains around 90%, CIP remains, remains about 10%, and adjust it annually as things change. Next year, the valuations for residential might go up again significantly. I expect they probably will. That means that more of the tax burden is gonna be shouldered by the residents. That's just math. So while the valuations, we tax on valuation, the, the effective rates for CIP continue to go down or stay the same. And I, you know, while I appreciate the arguments that we gotta be there for the small businesses and all, the fact of the matter is, is that we have been. We've done this by, by allowing the residential tax rate and shift to go, or valuations to continue to go up unaddressed by a tax shift. So that's my proposal. Um, I don't particularly expect a lot of support from it, but I just want to make the point. Thank you. Council Benson. With this, and I'm, I'm be entertained, seconding. Do you, could you tell me, like, what's the rough estimate that we could sit from your proposal? How much residents could save? Like a number? Could you give like a? It's right here. It's on, it's on, it's on the page. It's, okay. it's so about on, 135, 100. It's on page nine. Yeah. My point really well, is, is that 1.15 is and 1.20 is. So yeah. you'd have to go in between that. To that, see. that was my, that's what was, if you had like a rough. And if they don't do the individual, you'd have to do the math. Um, well, I got a C in math. Have it here. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> they've, actually, they've actually put it out here. It's on, it's on it the chart. It comes down to about 1.5 or 6 million savings on the um, residential side and um, probably a... Council, can we put this up so the public can understand what we're talking about? Can we put this slide up? Shift factor of 1.2 would be about $135. So it'll be a little yep, less than that. So you're on page nine right now? I'm on page 10. 10. Okay, you're on page 10. Oh, yeah. nine. You're right, nine. So there is no 1.18. Yep. There's a 1.15 and a 1.20. On page 10, if you look at page 10, you can get a shift of 1.2. Um, and extrapolate downwards. Shift 1.2, 100. You're looking at... Um... Um, yeah, but I know one to me on the... Left we, can we Value just... of a $500,000, yeah, right $90 savings yeah. for 1.2. And then you just... A little bit would be significantly... 
depending on the math. Yeah. Depending on the math. But my, my point is, is that the argument is that we're, we're penalizing commercial businesses with the shift that we're doing at 1.03, when in fact they've been getting effectively a shift in their favor by the fact that the evaluations, I mean, it's not, we're not shifting it, but the shift in the value of, of the, uh, of the residential property has skewed upwards so much so that resident commercial and industrial properties are effectively paying the same or if not less for taxes than they were eight years ago. Councilor oh, Worthley. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to get into it back and forth with Councilor to my left. I just think there's a question of economics that's missing, an understanding of economics that's missing. Okay. Um, we could save $15 or $11 for a resident who loses their job. Okay. If a Varian decided to go to Beverly in the Cummings Center, for example, where they have access to more employees, they have better roads, they have better school system in terms of rankings, we would lose hundreds of millions of dollars of income to residents. We want to talk about making this shift and using tax classification to make this shift. What we need to do is we need to draw more businesses here. And how do we do that? We have to have the tools to do that. And we are at a disadvantage being at the beginning of the line or the end of the line, depending on how you look at it, where a third, sorry, two thirds of our radius is water. So if you're trying to have a business locate here, and you say, well, your nearest group of employees are in Gloucester, but beyond that, you gotta go from Boston to get people that might be qualified for high paying jobs. Well, that's a disadvantage. They gotta pay more money for those same employees than someone might have to do in Burlington or Woburn or Beverly. So because we're at a disadvantage, we shouldn't make it harder for businesses by taxing them more we should work the opposite angle and say, what can we do to bring more businesses here to provide the residents that we care so much about to save $11 or $12 to provide them jobs? I don't think we, we just discount the value of a good paying job in Gloucester to save someone $11. It's not fair. So we want to talk about equity. We should be at 1.00. The reason why I made the recommendation of 1.03, and that was the motion that was on the table, is so that we wouldn't get into this random bingo let's game of just throwing out not, numbers. Let's, let's not editorialize, please. Okay, that's why I put forward the motion of 1.03 where the mayor recommended it. It was the same as last year. I don't like it at all. I'd rather be at 1.00, but I'm also looking at what's likely to be palatable to this council. This other math makes no sense because it's not what drives businesses to decide, decide to locate here. Anyway, the last thing on this for me, and I'm not going to get into it, is Thank you. when someone owns value, the value goes up, they own that equity. So the value is the value. That's what Mr. Pappas says. So when the value goes up, a resident owns that equity. Yes, they're taxed on it, but they own the equity. Thank God they do. Okay. I've said my piece. Oh, so grow. Thank you. I just want to point out a couple of corrections. First off, the motion on the table is, is the amendment. But secondly, as you pointed out, that we, we run the risk of losing uh, businesses to a place like Beverly or Danvers or Peabody all of which shift at 1.5 and then some of them 1.65. The current, current commercial industrial rate in Beverly right now is $21.94 per thousand, which is t more than twice what we're talking about doing here. I'm looking at it right it's now. It's not because there's more value, there are more businesses that are adding to that value. That, so the shift- the let's, commercial, let's, no, no back and forth, please. Commercial industrial rate is $21.94 per thousand. We're not Beverly. talking about, you know, let's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying but he's, he's making the point, if I could, the council is making the point that we run the risk of businesses in Gloucester relocating to Beverly where they'll be paying twice as much in property taxes. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion on the motion? I mean, the amendment. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. On the no. amendment? No, no. No, sorry. Can we can we do a roll call on the amendment? Yeah. All right, do a roll call. I don't know what I was doing. Councillor Gilman? No. Councillor Grace? No. Councillor Gross? No. Councillor Grow? Yes. Councillor Worthley? No. Councillor Benson? 
No. The vote is one in favor, six opposed. Right. I'm sorry. Where are you on here? Victoria. No. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councilor no. Mijota. No. How could we forget you? <laughs> I'm quiet tonight. The vote is one in favor, seven opposed, two absent. The motion fails. Thank you. Now back to the main motion. Discussion. Seeing none. I, I'd like to discuss it. Oh, sorry. Councilor Gilman. So I appreciate that we had a good conversation and, and it's really important that we looked at these numbers to understand it. So that, that's a positive thing. And um, I am sensitive to the fact that our commercial businesses continue to shrink, which is not a good thing. But my personal feeling and why I'm going to support this at 1.03 is that If our residents don't have have a perception that they cannot afford to live here anymore, they're going to spend less num money in the businesses and in, in the restaurants. And so I think where a lot of our businesses um, have folks that also live here, I think somehow it will kind of equalize in terms of where they benefit and where they don't. And um, so I'm going to be going with the recommendation from administration and sticking with the 1.03. Thanks. Also, Grow. Um, this is going to be counterintuitive. Um, I'm going to actually uh, oppose the 1.03, um, primarily because I think it's kind of a pointless gesture. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is that in the, in the very near future, we're very likely at looking at talking about tax increases and a, ta a property tax override. And what you're going to find out is that the residential uh, component is going to come out in force. Um, many people will support the concept of raising taxes, especially to help settle contracts. Um, but a lot of people are going to come out talking about how they can't afford to live here anymore. Um, the $15, I don't think, makes a difference uh, one way or the other. And I'm, I don't think it makes that much difference, frankly, in the commercial industrial uh, uh, personal property range either. Um, but... Uh, I think just on principle, I think I'm just going to go vote, vote on the 1.0. Thank you. Um, the, you know, Gloucester is, um, with the decline of the waterfront, um, has really suffered on its commercial side. Um, and, the, and basically, like it or not, we've become much more of a bedroom community where the tax base falls solely on the residents and it does so quite a bit here so um that's it i mean just our real problem is, is that we don't have enough commercial property to be able to help us help relieve the burden off the uh off the and that's it that's the only place i was going is that's the real the real difficulty hey council benton thank you um, on principle, I will be opposing this because I think that we, I would like to go even lower to supporting our business community that is, we're trying to get growth and we are seeing numbers continue to decline. Um, we are going to continue to see crisis arise and in the coming years we're going to see um, home, homes continue to deal with differences with getting insurance because we're going to see homeowners insurance crisis happening in coastal communities. This is going to be affecting us. And I think as we consider what's happening. Councilor, I'd like to remind you that this is a majority vote. Mm -hmm. It'll die if you and Councilor Crow just, just wanted to remind you of that. Okay. That, on that's that, not a simple majority. So on that, you're just on that point, if I may, you're saying it's five of the full council or four of the Four. Full council. Six. So it's six. Five. Oh, five. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I want to make sure we, I know what I just wanted people to know what so the, I, I want to know what it is. So it's five. Just five. How many are there? Yep. 
Mr. President, so Benson the floor. Can we uh, can we have clarification on the ramifications of this, please? Yes. Um, uh, Nancy, can you? I mean, oh, the, it's too bad the city auditor isn't available tonight. Well, you tell. I was advised by the city auditor that if it if this particular motion fails, you have to keep on voting until you can um, settle on a on a tax classification um, factor as well as a CIP shift. Council Majorita. Could we postpone could we postpone it until we get more um on a lot more information? No, not more uh, information. More, more Sorry, people. Counselors, we're missing two. I'm gonna withdraw my objection to the one point oh three. Thank you. There's there's major ramifications as far as the state and our reporting and all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's why I wanted to make sure if we're all here. Yeah, no, I don't think we can wait too long. Okay. If I'm remembering correctly, we were informed of that by the auditor at BNF. Can we do a roll call? Roll call, Madam Clerk. On the motion. We reread the motion just so we can make sure that we're completely clear on what the motion is. On a is. motion by Councilor Memard and seconded by Council Workley, the Budget and Finance Committee voted by roll call. Three in favor, zero opposed, to recommend that the City Council adopt a residential tax classification factor of 0 0.997200 that equates to a um, commercial industrial personal property shift of 1.03 for fiscal year 25. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Grace. Yes. Councilor Gross. Yes. Councilor Groh. Yes. Councilor Majota. Yes. Councilor Worthley. Yes. Councilor Benson. No. The vote is six in favor, one opposed, two absent. Entertain a motion to reconsider. So moved. We have a second. Second. A motion made by Councilor Worthley, seconded by Councilor Majota. Um. We can just do this by a simple vote, or we want to do it by roll call. Roll call. No. <laughs> oh, you got to wait till you're called. Was I a premature no? I'll wait for you to call. I'll be crazy. Like, I'm sorry. Sounded like me tonight. Sorry. I'm so excited being first. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gilman. No. Councillor Grace. No. Councillor Gross. No. Councilor Gro. No. Councilor Majota. No. Councilor Worthley. No. Councilor Benson. No. The motion to reconsider fails. Zero in favor. Um, seven opposed. Two absent. Okay. Next order of business, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Oh, Staff thank Clerk. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Public hearing 2024 number 31, RZ 2024 number four, council order 2024 number 21, amend Gloucester zoning ordinance section 5.7.4 planning board review and section 5.7.5D special permit criteria city council regarding adding third party independent review requirements. Well, Councilor Nolan was going to um talk to these, but we um, it, it was put forward that we stiffen up or make more clear the third party review, because as you'll see in, oh, sorry, <laughs> open the public hearing. <laughs> as you can see um, in the motion that, um, it was not in the motion, but it was it it was just a one short sentence in the planning board's um, uh, major uh, projects 
uh, zoning ordinance. It was not referenced really anywhere else where we actually, city council has the power. Um, so it was just made clear in that, in, in this motion, which is um, major projects. And I guess, is this the motion right here? Oh, right, 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 yep. So we are asking anyone who would like to speak in favor. I just did. Somebody online. I don't see anyone. We did get a. We did get a um, uh, nice letter from uh, uh, Grant Clark. We do the opposition first. Uh, well, I'm just saying he was in favor. Okay. I'm dealing with the in favor part. And now we will go for anyone speaking in opposition. The hand that was. Chuck was in favor of opposition. Linda McCarrison. She just raised it, yeah. Hey, Linda, you can speak either in favor or in opposition. You there, Linda? She's muted still. Linda, you're muted. Sorry, is that better? Yes. Actually, at the, the last second, you said anyone who was objecting to it. And I had um, sort of decided that I would contribute my maybe ignorant um, uh, thoughts before that. I think... Yeah, you can speak would, in favor also. I would like to speak in favor just because um, I think especially if we have if we have such people who are truly neutral or truly not part of you know all of um, the group that tends to be well the group that takes responsibility for making decisions i think an outside um observer an outside evaluator an outside um critic or in in inquirer would just looks and feels better um than than just running it back through someone that has already been part of the process or no one at all. And um, I am not deeply informed about any of this, but I've been involved in um, trying to help someone just, you know, hack her way through paperwork and rules and laws and ordinances and things. And wherever I have seen that, it has always felt to me like a breath of fresh air. And I would contribute that as something to be considered and whether or not it um, would be a nice change to make or an addition to make. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Linda. Anyone else wish to speak in favor or in opposition? Okay, do we have any communications? I have not received any. Do the councilors have any questions? Okay, I'm going to close the phone. Oh, oh, yeah, sure. So, can you? So, one of the communications was the one that we got, was it not? Or was it, it not in, there in time? Remember, we, right. Was not there. That's why you mentioned. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to bring that up. All right. Now I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, so, again, the committee report, which I just gave when I was speaking in favor. Actually, um, do you want, you want us me to, to get do it? it? P and D? You want me to give it? Give the committee report? Yeah. Sure. Motion on a motion, Council Gilman, seconded by Council Benson, Planning and Development, voted three in favor, zero opposed to recommend the Gloucester Zoning Ordinance Section 5.7 major projects be amended as follows. Section 5.74, Planning Board Review. Forthwith, upon their receipt, one copy of major project applications and plans submitted to the City Council for approval shall be transmitted by the city clerk to the planning board for their review and report regarding the special permit criteria below. The planning board may, when they deem it advisable, engage professional assistance at the applicant's expense for such review and report. Add, consideration should be given as to whether review by a third party independent consultant pursuant to general law ch chapter 44, section 53G 
would be appropriate due to the complexity of the application, plan submitted, and specific subject matter expertise required to thoroughly and review the application. And section 5.7.5D, special permit criteria city council. All other requirements of the zoning ordinance and of all applicable building codes must have been satisfied. Add, consideration shall be given as to whether a review by a third party independent consultant pursuant to general law chapter 44 section 53G would be appropriate due to the complexity of the application, plan submitted and specific subject matter expertise require, and, sorry, excuse me, and specific subject matter expertise required to thoroughly, thoroughly review the application. Specific attention is drawn to the requirements of the subdivision control law and the necessity of obtaining occupancy permits prior to the occupancy of any building or portion thereof. And I so move. Second. Um, motion made by Councilor Groh and seconded by Councilor Gilman because she had her microphone. There you go. On the motion? Um, discussion. On the motion, if I could. Um, in discussions at PD and, and with, with uh, City Solicitor Suzanne Egan, who, who um, wrote and, and supported this uh, change, this is literally belts and suspenders um, in terms of drawing more attention to the fact that third party review may and would probably be likely in complicated plans. There was some uh, question about whether or not the existing ordinances were a little vague on whether that would be a, a, a requirement or should be expected to be a requirement. So this language effectively clarifies that for applicants moving forward. And with that in mind, I support this moving uh, through the council. Councilor Worthley. Yes, thank you. Um, this started as a result of some advocacy from residents that were at a Ward 5 meeting, uh, specifically um, Grant Clark, Dennis McGurk, and the Preserve West Gloucester group. Um, there was a meeting that uh, Councilor Nolan asked me to fill in for because he couldn't make it. And then there was a secondary meeting after that where Councilor Gross and Councilor Nolan were there, and I applaud them for pushing this forward. I took the minutes and would have been happy to have been a co-sponsor of this. But this has really been an advocacy from residents themselves who have found that oftentimes, um, partly because of the way our process is where we don't open discussion up to all parties until maybe a final public hearing, but where a developer might have um, his or her lineup of professionals whose job it is is to help get a permit. And oftentimes a city has volunteers on boards and commissions who aren't necessarily experts in every field to give them the authority to have outside third party review. Not all development is good development. Not all testimony is accurate testimony. And this isn't a chance to have a third party come forward and say, no, the wastewater plan isn't going to do what the developer is expecting. This isn't going to work the way as, as outlined. And it gives the boards, at least the planning board and the zoning board, the authority to um, hire a third, party, um, uh, a third party to review this at the applicant's expense. So this would not be an additional expense, but it would give neighborhoods an opportunity to have a, a little bit more of a fair playing field. And so um, I was happy to be at those meetings. I congratulate Councilor Gross and Nolan on bringing this forward. And appreciate the vote from planning development to um, recommend this, and I'll be supporting it. Thank, Thank you. you. More discussion. I just like to say that um, I have noticed, and not just from Preserve, well before Preserve West Gloucester even existed. So before that meeting, I'd like to beg to differ that that's where it came from because I have considered watching, you know, three decades of. Um, Zoning Board of Appeals meetings, mostly, where the lawyer for the applicant was asked about significant issues that were there. And I was like, what is this? What is going on here? And when this, this uh, avenue came forward to be able to make sure that, that it's emphasized that this needs to be done, and it can be asked of, um, you know, when there's, if, anybody notices that there's been, you know, conflicting um, facts, facts that have been presented, they can um, call the mayor's office or city councilors and say, look, we, we want to have this put in. And it also is a, a 
an advantage to the applicant to know that this expense is going to uh, come up on their thing. The, the reason it doesn't say in here that it's at the owner's expense is because general law chapter 44 section 553G uh, is exactly what that is. So that's what that, um, that's what that states is that the applicant shall fund these, um, these uh, uh, third party reviews. Mr. President. Yep. If I could correct my student, which you did, but I'd like to just clarify that. This has been a problem for, you said 30 years, it's been probably for as long as we've had a zoning code, it's been a problem. Um, and look, not all attorneys are, are bad attorneys, right? Some people are doing the right thing, but sometimes they run the meeting and there isn't an opportunity for residents to oppose it with data, and this would be a way to help. The reason why I recognize um, Preserve West Gloucester is because they brought it to our attention at the ward meeting that Council Nolan had. It's been a problem for a long, long time, and as the letter that came in today from Dennis, uh, from Grant Clark said this is just a step and there could be a more robust um, review, but this is some, putting it on the books or clarifying what's on the books. But uh, you're right, this has been going on for a long, long time. Thank and, you. And you, know, and it wasn't even in the city council's special permit criteria. Um, but as we've seen at 20 Main Street, uh, the city attorney has insisted on third party reviews for almost everything. I point out though, if I could, just, just clarifying the clarifying. Uh, it does actually say in the in the uh, in the existing GZO that it's going to be at the applic applicant's expense, and this has been an option for the planning board and the ZBA to do. Whether they have done it appropriately over the over the years or not, it is an option that exists. This this language is great in bolding that 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 possibility, but again, it doesn't actually require that it happen. Oh, it does not. Um... But you know the sentence that you're referencing is said that the planning board may, when they deem it advisable, engage, engage professional assistance at the applicant's expense. That doesn't really, you know, that people don't understand what that means. So okay, we vote it. Yep. Um, roll call vote. Two thirds majority required. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Grace. Yes. Councilor Gross. Yes. Councilor Grow. Yes. Councilor Majota. Yes. Councilor Worthley. Yes. Councilor Benson. Yes. Vote is seven in favor, zero opposed, two absent. The motion passes. Um, next, Councilor Grove. What about public hearing? Um, no. We were, oh. Yep, yep. We're oh, next public, public hearing. hearing. Public hearing. Open the public hearing. I went straight down to the committee recommendation. Sorry. Let's. No speaking in favor and proposed to go right to the I, would, I don't see anyone with a hand up. There's no hands up. Can I just read what the public hearing sure. is? Okay. Public hearing 2024 number 32, RZ 2024 number 5, Council Order 2024 number 22 to amend the Gloucester Zoning Ordinance Section 5.9 Cluster Development Section 5.9.32 Review by Other Boards by adding a new subsection A Review by Independent Consultants. Thank you. Can I continue ahead of myself? In favor, opposed, <laughs> communications, questions? Oh, yeah. Communications? None. So no one's speaking in favor and no one's speaking in opposition. And the public hearing was opened at 9.15? Yes. Okay. Okay. We Not have no communication. I have not received any communications. All right. Questions from the counselors? Close public hearing. Committee report. Committee report. And a motion of Councilor Gilman, seconded by Councilor Benson. Planning Development Committee voted three in favor, zero opposed. Recommend. That the Gloucester Zoning Ordinance Section 5.9 Cluster Development Section 5.9.3.2 review by other boards be amended by adding a new subsection A as follows. Add A, review by independent consultants. The planning board should consider whether due to the complexity of the application, plan submitted and specific subject matter expertise required to thoroughly review the application, retaining a third party independent consultant pursuant to general law 44, Section 53G would facilitate the review process, and I so move. Second. Motion made by Councilor Groh, seconded by Councilor Gilman. Discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Councilor Gilman. Yes. Councilor Grace. Yes. Councilor Gross. 
Yes. Councillor Gro. Yes. Councillor Majota. Yes. Councillor Worthley. Yes. Councillor Benson. Aye. The vote is seven in favor, zero opposed, two absent. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, can you com explain to us this next motion because we've never had a motion to reconsider this council? Most right. of this council. So within 24 hours of a council vote, a councilor can move to reconsider a vote. And when they do that, the councilor needs to notify the city clerk's office, who in turn notifies the city council. And the matter is taken up at the next city council meeting. So um, Councilor Benson um, submitted a motion to reconsider the city council vote of October 22nd regarding the public hearing for um, amending chapter five building and building regulations. So Councilor Benson needs to make a motion to reconsider that vote. If the council does not um, move to do that, does not second that, um, then the motion dies and the vote stays as is. And if um, you do choose to consider the reconsideration, then you would be re-voting um, your vote. Uh, if someone does, um, give it a second. Do we go through the, on the reconsideration, do we first go through the no and yes votes on that? You would, first you need to entertain if you are all in agreement to reconsider the vote, just like we did with the loan order. I mean, I'm sorry, with the tax classification. Right. So it's, it's the usual yes or no. Yeah. So if we don't want to re reconsider, we vote no. Correct. And if you want to reconsider, you vote yes. Correct. Okay. Councilor Benson. I wanted to correct the record and say that I, I had originally meant to say nay to this. Um, and then I just, it wasn't clear. I must have not have said it loud enough, but I wanted to correct the record that I meant to vote no on this. On all of it? On all of it due to right now, right now with a cost of living crisis, I will not be supporting fee increases. So just right. So with businesses and everything, I just it's can't. Point of order. Do we need to get it. a motion on the table to yeah. reconsider? Yeah, so you can make that's the reason why. That's I, why I said make your motion first. Yeah. So my motion to reconsider the vote to correct the record. That is why. Says no. Right here's a motion. Okay. 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 Yep. Uh, motion to re. Uh, to the motion yeah. to reconsider. Motion for reconsideration. Um, Benson City Council vote of ten. 22-2024 regarding uh, PH 2024-33 amend um, GZO chapter five building, uh, GZO building and building regulations, uh, section five dash 15 building permit fees, subsection A, B, D, E, F, G, H, and J, and amend section 5-44 fees for electrical work, and amend G, Z, O, chapter, G, C, O, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 26, weights and measures, section 26-2, collection of fees by seal, sealer, and disposition thereof. And, so and I so move. Second. Motion made by Councilor Benson, seconded by Councilor Gro. We can only discuss the um, reconsideration of the motion. No discussion. Um, should we do a roll call vote on this? I have a question. Just a question. If he's just trying to change his vote to no. Do we need to vote yes to reconsider so he can vote no and we can vote yes on the main motion again? And do we have that main I, motion? I think we may have to go through them all, don't we? Do we have to go through all the motions again? Well, there was one motion that was made and then there was a, um, the yeah. full ordinance amendment was behind it. So it's not like oh, you're okay. going through each section okay, got individually. It. Got it, got it. Uh, the letters. Okay, roll call. Remember, remember which the votes mean. So on the motion to reconsider, Councillor Gilman. No. Councillor Grace. No. Councillor Gross. No. Councillor Groh. No. 
Council Member Jota? No. Councilor Worthley? Yes. Councilor Benson? Yes. A little support to my the vote is two in favor, weight. five opposed, two absent to reconsider. The motion to reconsider fails. Thank you. You got you're on the record. Um, Nobody's ever going to look at that again. We have um, next order of business. I get well next on for council vote. We have a speedway limit petition for Salt Island Road. Um, would someone like to read the motion? Anyone? I move the uh, vote mayor. to refer this petition to the mayor and traffic commission for review and approval in accordance with GCS chapter 21, section 21-88 and Mass General Law chapter 90, section 18. Thank you. So this is... Give me a second. Second. Uh, motion made by Grow, Councillor uh, Gilman, seconded. So this vote, this vote, these are Salt Island Road's private road, and they can set their speed limit with a city council vote, and they don't have to go to the state to petition permission to set the speed limit. So this is this is quite helpful for everyone who is burdened on private private ways. I, I do have a question. Yep. It was to 15 miles an hour, correct? That's I correct. don't I don't see that in the narrative or in it's, the. It's in the petition. Okay. I I read it. I just don't don't see it on our template. Thank you. We're only voting to send it to the mayor. And the right, mayor. I understand. Yeah. I used to live there, so, if, oh, so I, I get it. I, I get the 15 miles an hour. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, they had to get approval of a majority of the residents. All right. President, if I may, why wouldn't we have just had this on the consent agenda to refer to the committee and to the mayor? Do we just do it as a separate vote for any particular reason? Or just we had it on the consent agenda last time. Send to the traffic commission? Yeah. I mean, because it's the second time, yes. The reason this is appearing, if it looks familiar to you, it's because at the last city council meeting, it was on the consent agenda to refer to a future city council meeting for council vote, because that's kind of how the city ordinance makes it look. But when I went into the mass general law, it actually spells out that it needs to be referred to um, the mayor and the traffic commission need to approve it. And then once that approval comes, it, I think it was went to ONA. I don't remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember where it was referred for, to the for, first time. That went to ONA. So once ONA gets it, they're gonna wait for the um, the recommendation from the mayor and the traffic commission, and then you can move ahead and vote on it. So We're just future, voting to refer this. So for future conditions like this, we should just send it to ONA, the mayor, and the traffic commission. Okay, thank you. Learn. On that out. So, okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Seven to nothing with two absent. I would like to vote to refer this petition to, oh, sorry, you Go should ahead. announce it. Please, uh, private way speed limit petition for Paul Free Road. Vote to refer, I have a motion to refer this petition to the Mayor and Traffic Commission for review and approval in accordance with. GCO Chapter 21, Section 21-88, and Mass General Law Chapter 90, Section 18, and I so move. Second. Motion made by Councilor Grow, seconded by Councilor Worsley. Well, I think Val I thought it. you got in there first, but we'll change that to seconded second. by Councilor Gilman. Thank you. <laughs> Very important to me. <laughs> All right. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I, um, all those opposed? Motion passes seven to zero with two absent. Now we have individual counselors discussion, including report. Well, we don't have any reports. Um, so do we have counselors discussion and then later we'll get to, um, there is none, I guess we have none. So we're going right to counselors request to the mayor. Oh. Councilor Gilman. Thank you. I like being right. first. Well, we go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so I, I have one request to the mayor um, through the chair. Um, I would like to ask that under communication to city council section 3-8, um, I would like to request that we have a presentation 
in front of the council on an overview of um, Prop two and a half and the status of our financial situations in the city. And um, it can be at the beginning of a meeting, just a simple presentation. It can be short and sweet, but I think it would be helpful because it, we're, a lot of people are talking about Prop two and a half and what that means. And I think it would be helpful to get an update on what it means. And um, and so I'm requesting that we have that at whatever meeting council president feels that we can um, fit that in. Well, that would be at the, um, whatever the administration can um, come come forward with that. It's because simple, you, I think Kenny, asked, could, yes, I think Kenny mayor. and, and, and um, you know, I, but, what, whatever. That, uh, no, that's you, my recommendation. We yep. can talk about the yes. specifics. So, I mean, they, they would get back to me and then we put it on. Yeah. And Council Worthley had also brought up a need for a meeting similar to this. And he was talking more about the budget. But this is kind of part of the budget. But it's it's really something that we keep talking about it. And pe I think it would be helpful for all of us to get grounded again on what that means and, and um, what the numbers are for different incremental amounts of money like we did when we approved the East Veterans School. We understood what the rate was gonna be, how much it would burden the taxpayers, et cetera. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Councilor Grace. Yeah, um, I wanted to just show, uh, give a thank you to the Traffic Commission, to Mike Hale and his crew for um, so very, very quickly getting the stop sign um, at the end of Acacia Street where it meets Grove Street and also the um, handicap sign on Acacia Street. It was literally up within a couple of days. Um, very fast work, thank you. Um, and also thank you to um, Mike and his crew for getting the school zone signs on Centennial Avenue. I think um, it will make, it's, you know, it's it was very, very important, I think, and um, the residents appreciate having that, you know, kind of bright yellow, um, reminder to slow it down a little bit coming down that hill um, by the high school. Um, and my request to the mayor is if we could um, instill a, a bit more urgency and um, um, just, you know, proactive stance on applying the, the laws that we pass here in regard to safety, um, as in parking on sidewalks and parking on crosswalks. We have uh, so much discussion in the last year and a half about having this be a walkable city. But it's not a walkable city if you have to walk in the middle of the street because the sidewalks are all clogged with um, boats on trailers and cars and trucks and whatnot. So that's my request. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to second uh, Council Gilman's uh, request for a, uh, a primer on Chapter 2 and a half, uh, levy override. Uh, I think it's something we're going to be talking about more uh, in the coming Weeks as we uh, as we see the progress on the, uh, the teacher negotiations and the parent negotiations, and also bring up glad she brought up the idea of perhaps maybe having a, a, a quarterly review of where we are on uh, revenue and expenses. Um, there's a lot of talk in in, in the public about how uh, we can just find the money in the existing budget. Um, I don't necessarily agree to that with that. Um, uh, Perspective. I think that we've we've passed a pretty lean budget, but I think it's important to get a sense of where we are with with the uh, with the finances of the city at this point in the game, because uh, sooner or later that contract is going to come down, and we're going to have to deal with how to pay for it, which is fine. Um, I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, it, it would be awful nice to know where we stand with relation to what we actually have in house in terms of our rev revenue expend and expenditures. And also, what whether or not that would then require pursuing a levy override, and it, and it, at that point, how much we'd be looking at doing. So the sooner we can do that, I think the better. Thank you, Council Member Joyta. No request. Council so Worthley. Yes. Uh, firstly, I would like to commend Grace Boyer and the clerk's office for a fantastic job yet again, managing the hardest job, the hardest, most demanding job in the city, uh, especially with the election, and it was done flawlessly. Your staff is awesome. We didn't hear any 
discrepancies. I'm sorry, we were going to say something. We didn't hear any discrepancies. We didn't hear any concerns. Um, you know, we're we're grateful and blessed that you're leading an office and your staff really deserve. And just pass it on to them how grateful we are for the work they did. Thank you. Um, and it, I think it was a month ago or maybe six weeks ago. I can't. I've lost track. But I did make that request to the mayor, and I, I kind of sense that Council Gilman and Grow are agreeing with it. That and I appreciate that too that we should have um, some sort of a budget sort of here, you know, preview of what's coming. Um, or even if it's just an overview that's general. Um, when on Thursday night we had a budget and finance committee meeting where we decided to postpone a review of where we are right now, but the review looks like we're, we're on track. And on track means possible surpluses like we've had over the last three years. I don't know. but We looked at that. We decided we're going to go into detail at a future meeting. No, we, we didn't go into great detail line by line. It was on the agenda, but it was a long meeting, and we decided to move it forward another week. But you know, that was Thursday night, and the mayor says on Friday in some of his public relations uh, press conferences that there's a 4 to $7 million deficit. And I just want to be really careful because some people have heard that there's money that's missing, okay, unaccounted for. It's People have heard, I've heard people say, that that's just gross overspending in one unidentified area. And it's really unfortunate that there's this misunderstanding of what that means. I think he's saying he's hearing or projecting that there'll be a four to $7 million deficit in the next year's budget. But I would like to think that the council that approves a budget and the Budget and Finance Committee would have access to that information. So I would really like to ask the mayor to do a presentation on what those numbers are so we can all speak intelligently about it and not just sort of read about it on social media and then have to react to it. So that's my request. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just I think to say that the, the um, Veteran Services Office, V and Brian, pulled off a, another uh, fabulous, not fabulous, but really great, um, really wonderful um, respectful uh, uh, Veterans Day service and wreath hanging, and Ruth Pino and Joanne Kukuru up at the Veterans uh, Vietnam Vets Memorial. I'd just like to thank them and recognize the fact that they, and we had a gorgeous day too, so that was, that was really a, a big plus. Could I add, you did a fine job representing the mayor and the city at the ceremonies as well. Yep. Which I didn't have to. Yeah. Kind of tough when you got a cold and things. It, oh, I know, but I'm not done. <laughs> Sorry, Dylan. I meant I should have called you first. I know. I know. I know you don't like me today. That's yeah. That's um, you know that. Um, anyway, I just sent everybody that um, that report that we got, which um, one on the city side is 19 pages. And it just breaks it down by department, doesn't to tell you what's what's been spent, what hasn't been spent, and what they have for in in uh, in uh, encumbrances. encumbrances. Thank you. Uh, schools is just four. Schools is just four pages. Councilor Benson. I don't. I don't have anything. I concur with the council president on on the Veterans Day, and we honor our veterans and their sacrifice to our community, our nation. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. Motion made by Councilor Grow, seconded by Councilor Worthley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes seven to zero Linda. with two absences.